Three, two, one. One does not simply listen to Sardinacast. Or maybe you do. You might be listening right now. Um, <laughs> this is Sardinacast. I'm Adam from Your Movie Sex. I'm Ralph from You Took a Sub Dollar from yeah. Here. And I'm Alex from IHE. And that was a nice throwback intro yeah. that time. Yeah, I, I was like thinking that. of uh, Lord of the Rings quotes. And that one seemed to be the most fitting and least obnoxious, I guess. I didn't want to just like start off the podcast with like potatoes, boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Stick them in a stew. Yeah. yeah. It's a very quotable franchise. <laughs> Incredibly. Everything's a meme <laughs> That's now. I to say good. Before we get into the uh, Lord of the Rings discussion, there's a bit of uh, movie related news I'd like to get your opinions on. So, Universal let everybody know that uh, their Trolls 2 movie, not to be confused with Troll 2, but Trolls, whatever the subtitle is. Uh, <laughs> the DreamWorks film, yeah. Yeah. No, I thought it was Universal. Didn't Universal? Trolls is DreamWorks. Yeah. No. Oh, but remember, Universal um, owns DreamWorks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that would be the why. minions are under the same thing. Okay. It's like <laughs> House Strange Dragon now, which is messed up. So Anyway, yeah. they publicly uh, stated that uh, the sequel film, Trolls 2, <laughs> uh, released only digitally was more successful than the first Trolls movie, which had a theatrical run and then digital. And now AMC, a theater chain in the United States, is very, very angry. And uh, they have publicly stated (laughs) at this point that they're not going to be showing any Universal films in their theaters anymore, which is kind of hilarious. Really? Yeah. It's insane. Because I I can understand their perspective because they're like, oh, no, this you can't let other studios know that this is a viable option and that you could do things this successfully because then they'll do it (laughs) after the pandemic and then we'll be out of a business right so i understand that perspective but you think that that's just making it worse if you're (laughs) if you're not showing any universal films in your theaters anymore like no more jurassic world right they don't want the other studios to do it rise agree yeah Yeah. they're gonna do Theaters are going to go out of business if they can't make that kind of money. It's, yeah. This has been tried before with um, at Tower Heist. They tried releasing Tower Heist digitally early, mm-hmm. and theaters were like really uptight about that, and, yeah. and you know nothing happened. But this is way more successful, apparently. Yeah, so, it's kind of inevitable. I don't know. I'm I'm more on the theater side though. Yeah. Well, I don't I, want them to do shit like this because then theaters are going to close. Yeah, I, I I agree with you in the sense that like I love film festivals and a lot of the venues for film festivals are just theaters that at other points in the year they're used as regular movie theaters. Yeah, um, exactly. So that would be Colleges, terrible yeah. for all of these theaters to, cl- to close. Although it's mm. happening to a lot of them anyway. And at the same time, I kind of I don't I don't I don't know how strongly I feel about the situation as a whole when it comes to like whether or not films should be released digitally because I like that option. Like, I don't see why you can't have an option to do both. Mm-hmm. I like it, too. How much was it released for, also? I think it was probably, like, like... I rented Invisible Man, and it was 20 bucks. Yeah, I think it was around it there. For 48 hours. Yeah, so, like, that's a lot of money. It is, but it's People also... People might be willing to pay that now, but I don't know if in a year, when you have the option to go to a theater, if people are going to pay that. When you're, when you're releasing a, a children's film, especially, though, like, the implication is that it's being watched by more than one person anyway. Like, no one's expecting a child yeah, to buy it on their exactly. iTunes account. It's usually, like, a family of four or something is the implication. So that's a lot more cost-effective than taking a trip out to the movie theater, buying four tickets and popcorn and, yeah, you know, gas so money and <laughs> stuff. So, I mean, mm-hmm. it seems like a viable thing. I don't know. I like the option. I like the option existing. I don't know what yeah, that would I mean. Then less people stream. would go to the theater if you just have the option to go at home. It seems like kind of a, a reaction based on a lot of fear, this whole AMC thing. I feel yeah. like a lot of companies in these situations are kind of, they're bricking themselves at this reality they have to face themselves with right on the back of like some of the most profitable years in terms of like these just billion dollar movies just yeah. every year. So I think it's been a bit of a shock for them. And they're obviously an industry that's kind of set in its ways, being forced to change radically. Is gonna, there's going to be a lot of pushback to that, no matter what, I think. I, I And also another side of it is 
contextually, you can probably understand why this Trolls movie is doing better in the same way a lot of other things that have gotten popular during lockdown yeah. may have got a bit of a boost just for yeah, this. Like Tiger because King. Because of the, you know, yeah, like Tiger King or um, a lot of video games of getting like Animal Crossing mm. is just seeing mm. ridiculous numbers. Like just because people. Yeah, people are looking for things to keep themselves busy and, you know, there are loads of kids at home at the moment. Just There are probably loads of frustrated yeah. parents that want something to distract their kids with and they've seen the posters for the new Trolls movie, so... Yeah. I don't know what it's going to really dictate for the future beyond just these, like, growing pains of where it's inevitably going because uh, how long can they really push back from it? Because we've been saying, like, since the podcast began about how, like, movie theatres are kind of... That they're turning into like blockbuster kind of, you know, like Scorsese said about like superhero movies mm-hmm. where they're like a, a, a theme park, park or yeah. something. A theme park, yeah. Theme park ride, yeah. And that a lot of the smaller stuff is being relegated to streaming services and stuff like that, which personally I don't even really mind that much. You know, I think more eyes on it, the better. Mm-hmm. And then instead of, you know, it just being lost in the sea of content we're in. Yeah, I I feel like depending on the theater too. Like if you make your theater experience enjoyable, if you make it something that people actually want to go to, rather than being like, oh, I hate that I have to see this in theaters, but it's only playing there. I think your your business will survive. Like I'm expecting people to still be going to like Alamo Draft House, right? Like that's a desirable mm-hmm. theater experience. Like really good food. You know, no one's allowed to use their phones and text and talk. Like. They have a strict policy on that, so you can't you can't really have your movie ruined by just some asshole in the theater, theoretically, <laughs> you know? Like, that's a desirable experience. Yeah. So they, they like to do a lot of, like, reruns, older cinema stuff. You know, like, they'll, they'll have, like, special movie nights, and people go to them because they like the theater, not because it's their only way to see the movie. It's, like, it's a nice experience. So I think in that way, there's a lot of room for theater chains to catch up. And maybe AMC should be considering how to improve their business so that people actually want to keep using their theaters. So you never know. There's a, yeah. there's a couple different factors. Well, saying to Ralph before we started recording about how... I, I don't know if I'm that confident if people are going to be s- that willing to swarm back to movie theaters yeah. even when like governments take their fingers out and kind of give us free reign on what we're allowed to do like i think people are going to be kind of trepidatious <laughs> probably yeah. to like you know for a while like i can't put like an, a number down to it but uh, it's not really like in the forefront of a lot of people's minds right now i don't think it's like yeah you never know to the cinema yeah to go see tenant yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> i don't want to get out of the house uh, though fuck. i think people want something to do so I think they will go back to do something, either go eat. And everything's yeah. going to be at like half capacity. Know. Yeah, it depends on the person, depends on the place, depends on the type of thing. <laughs> like a lot of people will want to be going out and doing things, but I don't know if a lot of people want to be going out into a, a room with a bunch of people in circulated air. Uh, so Yeah, I'm just thinking about how much money's being lost by this. Like oh, it yeah. must just be, <laughs> be absurd Economic from like, all these disaster. studios that... Yeah, and all these uh, shareholders that were kind of counting on releases and certain dates and times, and they're obviously not being hit because of this. So there just be, must be so much money just being thrown to the wind at the moment. So I, that's why I just want to see what they're going to decide to do, because I, I don't know if how many more months they can survive just <laughs> not showing anything. Like It's just an absurd amount of money that's being yeah. lost. You know? Yeah. I don't know if like Hollywood studios will need like a bailout or anything like they make a lot of money i don't know no i'm thinking more of the actual theaters themselves no the theaters for sure yeah how they're, they're struggling but oh yeah, yeah especially independent theaters this. yeah i think amc yeah. like filed for bankruptcy or something not, not too long ago mm-hmm. so wow if they don't want universal to be releasing their movies digitally then how does banning their movies from your theater help at all you think that's only just going to make it worse. Now they're like, okay, well, if we're if we're not even showing our movie in the most popular theater chain in America, then we might as well just do it digital anyway. Yeah, just like, <laughs> to, just to <laughs> yeah, make but, a, our money back. They're hoping like that'll, a, let, that'll stop other theaters or, uh, sorry, other studios from doing that. Yeah, I guess so. Um, 
because then Disney will start doing it, and then yeah, you think all Disney all gives a shit it. about other businesses? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. They have tons they don't of money. Care if they watch up, something first else of all, go belly they up. got billions of dollars. They can hold out for like ten years if they need to. Yeah. So they're fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they can release everything on Disney Plus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that's a very real possibility. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that because I found it interesting. We'll see what that happens. Again. Interesting. Yeah, but the reason Universal and Disney would do that is because they want to make all the money and take the theaters away from that. Not you know, the theaters are taking a percentage. Mm. They don't want them to. Oh yeah, I think and they up. get more of the revenue just by releasing it digitally, like the revenue yeah, share from the actual revenue. sale. So you know, if they're a business, I guess that's fine. But it's kind of corrupt. Mm -hmm. Isn't that corrupt? <laughs> What's that line from again? Oh, come on. You gotta know. Is it Neil Breen? Or? Neil Breen. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, Fateful Findings, I yeah. think. Yeah. It's the one where he's in the mansion. I, I, the I was screen. leaning towards Neil Breen. I just wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess, uh, I guess we can start our uh, film trilogy discussion. Uh, previous episode, I recommended a little hidden gem known as uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy from yeah, I never heard of it. Peter Jackson. Yeah, what's this? <laughs> it's pretty cool. And I guess we'll go through one movie at a time, although they're pretty consistent. I mean like not <laughs> not like uh not like exactly the same in terms of like how much I enjoy them or quality, but it's 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 a trilogy that really feels like it it was all conceived as Coherent. one big idea yeah. rather yeah. than just like, it feels okay, like we made movie. enough money for a sequel. Like they were already mm -hmm. making all three of them before the first one was even released, like, which is insane. I don't see a lot of Such releases a like that anymore. They made all of them as if they were one movie too. Yeah. I think they even paid everyone for one movie. <laughs> I think so, <laughs> which is pretty really? funny. Yeah. So they like worked on basically three movies, but really you got to cut down on costs. I mean, the budget wasn't that big on this. Yeah, I don't think. they were like ninety million dollars each, which is pretty low yeah. considering what it is. I think I don't yeah. know. It's like in two thousand or something. Even adjusted for inflation, it's like twenty years ago now. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how fast inflation's gone, but let's assume it was even like I don't know twice as much. I guess that seems reasonable. It's like one hundred eighty million dollars per movie. But still, it's like, I don't know, Amazon's spending like a billion dollars on their production yeah. costs. They bought the rights for yeah. $250 million and then they're spending a billion on production costs. And the, this trilogy is like the length of a miniseries. So it's like, what the what the hell yeah, is Amazon doing? Like, what, what are yeah, they doing? they're doing like another prequel, from my understanding. A prequel? Because like The Hobbit is already a prequel. Yeah, they're doing like a prequel show. Really? That is set before the events of Lord of the Rings what? and The Hobbit. Okay, that's my understanding of it. I thought mm -hmm. I, I thought for sure that they would try to like just remake the Lord of the Rings story that you know the popular that's thing what that I everybody thought knows. At first too. No, but no, no, I don't weird. think so. Anyway, uh, Lord of the Rings: Fellowship of the Ring. If you haven't seen any of these movies, watch them and come back because you're gonna get spoiled. We're gonna talk about spoilers. <laughs> Fellowship. <laughs> it's a it's a story about a hobbit and he has an uncle or whatever named bilbo was it his uncle <laughs> he has a really he has a friendly yeah, relationship so. with <laughs> bilbo that i think does was a family say, member yeah that sounds right yeah God, i can't believe i'm blanking on that but that does sound right <laughs> irrelevant <Family member>. yeah. <laughs> they're they're really close <laughs> and uh yeah, bilbo nephew whatever yeah and bilbo found a ring at one point and it's a crazy ring and he loves it too much. And then Gandalf shows up and he's a wizard and he's like, yo, that ring's bad. Frodo, <laughs> you take it. <laughs> we need to get rid of this shit. And it starts them on a gigantic adventure full of uh, peril and conflict and friendship and hope. And uh, I love it. What did you guys think? Yeah, they're all great. Mm -hmm. All these movies are great. Yeah, they're essential viewing. Yeah, they this, are. Um, maybe we should start by saying uh, what our kind of experience with yeah, sure. the, the story is and which version we watched, because, of course, there's the extended and the mm -hmm. normal versions, which have some pretty, I'd say, significant differences. Like The third one's like nearly an hour longer, <laughs> like the extended version, so that's a lot of stuff. But Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, this story has always been a part of my life because I'd, I'd listened to like the... 
there's a really good BBC radio mm-hmm. like play version which I listened to growing up so I really like that stuff and then the movies came out when I was young so it's always been there but it wasn't really until I was 16 17 where I kind of rediscovered them with a bit more of a grown up mind and started to appreciate them for what they were and became like properly obsessed with them and watched like all of the the, the onslaught of special features yeah. that this trilogy is known for. God, there is so much extra content if you're into that kind of stuff. Just endless stuff about like concept art and visual effects and planning and all this stuff. It, it's really cool. So all that stuff really sucked me in. Haven't watched yeah. it though for quite a few years until just the other day for this episode, mm-hmm. which was quite fun to re-experience. I watched them on TV when I was like younger. Mm-hmm. I didn't see them in a theater or anything. I liked them. I thought they were fine. But I, they grew on me as I got older, I think. Like more the like the technical aspects of it, mm-hmm. the battles and like how all like like the makeup was done and the the size of the hobbits compared to like the yeah. people and the, the force perspective the doors, is like, fucking the force awesome. perspective is really cool. Yeah. Like all that is super cool to me. I'm not a big like fantasy guy, mm-hmm. so I don't like I don't like Tolkien. I don't like like elves and all this shit. But <laughs> this is clearly like something special. This is not like a run-of-the-mill fantasy Mm -hmm. it's a great story it's got Mm -hmm. a lot of great characters in it yeah it's it's epic shit yeah i watched it uh when i was younger pretty sure i saw them in theaters pretty sure i would have been 10 when the first one came out so Mm -hmm. i don't know i'm pretty pretty sure i watched them in theaters because i've I vividly remember at the end of the first movie there being that they they had this um, trailer at the end of the movie basically for the second movie and they used like a, an orchestral rendition of the music from Requiem for a Dream that ba da ba da ba ba da oh, yeah gosh, and they were like yeah, teasing about Gollum that. yeah there's that like time <laughs> I vividly remember that that's cool so I'm pretty sure <laughs> that's I saw hilarious it yeah I I've always really enjoyed these movies. And yeah, obviously, you know, growing older, I haven't seen them in like 10 years uh, <clears throat> up until I just watched them for this episode. Yeah, I do appreciate a lot more of the uh, technical aspects, that's for sure. And especially I, like I wish that I had seen more of uh, Peter Jackson's older films. I've seen the Brain Dead slash Dead Alive one. I still haven't seen a few of his other mm-hmm. ones like Frighteners or Bad Taste. Uh, I would love to check out some of his Meet other older films. movies. Yeah, I haven't seen that one either. But even just from watching like Brain Dead, which I think is a mm-hmm. hilarious movie <laughs> that, that I would recommend yeah, everybody see. Even just watching that one, like there's a lot of interesting stuff in there too, like the force perspective, like, you know, like a bunch of actors with crazy makeup and stuff. And so you can see little hints of what would eventually turn into this gigantic, super ambitious professional studio project. You can see little hints of it mm-hmm. even in something like like brain dead, which I find kind of interesting. Also, on that note, I mean, I, I I was thinking while watching this trilogy, this might sound like a strange comparison, but I feel like there's a lot of similarities between the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the Raimi Spider Man trilogy. Because mm-hmm. they're both from they're both from directors that used to create horror movies, right? And these horror movies weren't just like, you know, jump scare or slasher. Like they weren't bland horror movies. They're horror movies that were celebrated because they were so wacky and there was something to the filmmaking there. Like really interesting cinematography and ideas being presented in those movies. And then they get like this big budget studio feature of something that's a bit more like fantasy that takes itself a bit more seriously. But there's still that kind of playfulness with the films that you know there's something genuine there like it's it's so weird what what you get when you have a director like that that had made a bunch of wacky bizarre horror Mm -hmm. movies and then just give them a gigantic project like this there's so many things about this trilogy that just have like early 2000s tropes in there not just tropes but like the feel of of watching the film some of the effects kind of felt really within that uh within that time frame too yeah especially if we're talking about fellowship mm-hmm. with it being the first one that is definitely the most aged in terms of some of the visual stuff M- mostly it, like the cg when they show golem the little teasers of golem it's not mm-hmm. the best most detailed stuff that shows a bit of age the 
mm-hmm. the troll kind of battle in the Moria mines. Um, the troll doesn't hold up the very best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's like some fades and stuff that are like weird. <laughs> yeah. There's one that was like posted on the Reddit that was kind of funny. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Some slow mo. Yeah, no, too. I, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> yeah the slow mo. It doesn't take me um, out of the movie. Like I wouldn't. Yeah, I don't hate the films because of that. But the artificial slowing down, dated. where you just have less frames. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a stylistic again, thing too. Yeah. Like he did yeah, that exactly. in King Kong, also. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It it, it was much more that. common <laughs> back then. It was more acceptable yeah. then. Now I think if you put it in a movie, it's kind of like annoying, but. Yeah, it didn't it didn't ruin the movie for me or anything. If we're going to talk about like aged visual effects though, I would say the most aged one would be uh the the tentacle creature outside of the cave when it's like oh, grabbing right, Frodo. Yeah. Like that, that was the, the moment where I was yeah. like, mm, yeah. Eh. But the rest of it I th- I thought was fine. So which versions did we watch? Oh yeah. I watched the extended ones. Mm-hmm, me too. Now, for this for this one. I'd never seen them. So it Okay, was cool. so we all watched extended yeah. then. Yeah. I'm pretty yeah. sure I I honestly don't know if I had seen the extended or not because they're like I, I always thought that I had never seen them and maybe I hadn't until now but like there wasn't anything that felt too unfamiliar but I guess it might just be because I hadn't seen it in 10 years anyway but like mm-hmm. I guess every added scene seemed to be like I guess context for the other scenes they didn't seem like so wild and crazy and different there's nothing mm-hmm. too egregious there there are a couple scenes that I think are obvious, um, like as to why they would have been trimmed out of the mm-hmm. th- theatrical version, just for pacing's sake. But Peter Jackson said, like the extendeds are just kind of. He considers the theatrical ones like the the pure cuts of the movie, but the extended ones are kind of like for the fans. Like if you just nerd wanna, cut. Like, indulge, yeah, basically <laughs> is the way to do it. So anytime there are kind of like pacing issues in the extended ones, I. I can't really get annoyed because like, I could just yeah. watch the theatrical ones because it's not like a George Lucas thing where that you can only watch the extended. You can choose <laughs> yeah, what you want. He's trying to change it. And exactly. there's a bit of a debate behind like some people think two of them are better extended, but one theatrical. So oh, really? it's like up to it's a bit up to interpretation, I think. Because yeah, because like some of the purists like will only watch the extended ones because it has more like detail and context. And I was looking up like a bunch of the differences. Um, between the two and it does seem like some pretty core stuff is missed out of the uh, theatrical cuts um, especially in the third movie which I guess we can talk about later but yeah when we get to it I guess yeah one interesting thing but from watching it this time around I, th- I think Fellowship is my favorite of the three I think it's the best one of the three as well I, I would agree this, this it's, watch is kind of the tightest that. most focused to be fair, it is also the point in the story where it's not kind of split up into all these different plots yeah, that are happening plot, across plot, the world. Because yeah, because basically at the end of Fellowship is where it starts to splinter off, and mm-hmm. that's something I actually admire about like the Two Towers with how complex it starts becoming without like tripping over itself. But there is something so clean about Fellowship and simple, and it's just about it's just kind of a simple A to B kind of journey. With the all the adventure kind of tropes, all the fun moments with the every, every scene is kind of like nicely blocked off into like mini set pieces, little mm-hmm. reveals, dumps of exposition. There's like a really good, especially in the extended edition. I really like the kind of slow way they build up the kind innocence of the world. You're introduced at like kind of a nice point for all the characters. Yeah. So you see this really wonderful. Um, contrast as the films get more gray and dark like the two towers in contrast to fellowships way darker and by the end like they're crawling around in the mud and they're like disgusting yeah. so it is nice to see the, yeah. the visual change it's it's mm-hmm. important because you you need that context for parts in the story where they say like oh if we if we fail there there's not going to be a shire mr frodo you know, it's like you have to have mm-hmm. that emotional connection back to it. And especially with the music, too. The music is so incredibly yep. nostalgic for me. But also, like, even if you, even if it's like your first time watching the film, there's elements of nostalgia in there by the time you get to the third movie when they play, or play the Shire theme at the end when everything's wrapping back up. And it's like, OK, like yeah, it's a, it's a nice little neat package wrapped in a bow. But yeah, I agree with you um, that the first film is like its own 
it's it's the best film. It's the best like contained experience because it doesn't really mm-hmm. it doesn't need anything set up from any of the other films to to be enjoyed. Yeah. Whereas like Two Towers, you're missing a lot of context if you've never seen the first one. <laughs> you know, like same mm-hmm. with Return of the King. Even. Yeah, I don't know if you could watch those without watching yeah. the first one. They're kind of dependent yeah, on the Fellowship first film. Is great. Yeah, I, I think I like Two Towers more just because of Helm's Deep. Mm-hmm. I like all of them about equally. That's fair. In terms of the characters and everything. Also, that one with Gollum, like the introduction of Gollum and all that stuff, him talking to himself. Like, I find all that so interesting. Mm-hmm. I, I like Frodo and, and Sam, like going off to Mordor. I think all that shit is great. Mm-hmm. Fellowship had a great ending, too. Yeah. Like, uh, not just the battle, but like it ended on like a like a low point. Like the the characters are like two of them get kidnapped and... There's like uh, the the guy who plays uh, Ned Stark dies. I forgot his name. I don't know any of their oh, names. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. Sean Bean. <laughs> You're gonna have to help me with some of the names. Yeah, Sean Bean, who dies in everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was like a low point. So it was like this this fun adventure, but then it ends with the Fellowship failing, and they even say like the Fellowship has failed. But it's like it's okay. It's just the start of the adventure. We'll yeah. Pick it up next it's bittersweet. time. Bittersweet. And it's like, oh, I'm really excited to see the next movie now. It didn't. It wasn't like a cliffhanger where I felt like I wasn't satisfied by the end. Yeah. Or that things weren't resolved. It, it wasn't I wanted a, uh, to see the next one. <laughs> it wasn't a Matrix yeah. Reloaded ending. Well, it wasn't like The <laughs> Hobbit, Desolation of Smaug, where it was literally oh, yeah. like yeah. a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. guess if we're gonna yeah. make comparisons, you could even just yeah, you could go back to a the dragon. series itself. Yeah, and it's like, okay, I, I, we could have seen that in this movie. It's a 10-minute sequence that's just plopped onto the third film. Yeah. Um, enough about the Hobbits. I, <laughs> I think they all end pretty strong, to be honest, yeah. and suitably yeah. for the story they're telling in the movie. I've never mm-hmm. read the books, so I don't know if like that's just oh, the right. same ending as the books, because there are three books, I believe. It's the same. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. There are three I'm books, assuming, and yeah. The Hobbit, and The Cimmerillion, and a bunch of other mm-hmm. stuff. There's like so, so much nerd lore if you want to go oh, yeah. into it. My roommate, uh, Gael, was watching this with me, and I knew he would be excited too. And he mm-hmm. was basically like my uh, my own little codex or whatever. <laughs> like uh, <laughs> he, he like pulled up a map. I was like, okay, so they're actually like moving over here. And so in this scene... At the beginning, when they actually go to the bar, that's actually way further away, and that's like a three-day trip. But the way it's cut, it almost seems like they just went to the bar and came back that night. But that's like a three-day trip. That's like over here, mm-hmm. and like all the lore <laughs> and stuff, and just how things work. It was it was really interesting. I I, I don't uh, yeah. I'd never be able to memorize all that. Like, uh, but yeah, it was it it made the experience a bit more interesting because there was a lot of information that I didn't have previously, and there's a lot of lore when it comes to Lord of the Rings oh, yeah. shit. There's just so much nerd mm-hmm. stuff. It's crazy. Tolkien is very dense. Yeah. His worlds were very, yeah. Mm-hmm. I love the the orcs, too. One of the best parts of the movies is, like, when they introduce the orcs, mm-hmm. whether it was, like, the like when they were birthing them or whatever in those caves, yeah, the, and they were playing that music. Yeah, and you like, the, the, mu- the music's bum, going, bum, like, yeah, bum. it's the camera sweeping bum, over them. Bum, bum, it was epic. Bum. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. Yeah. It's, it's so cool. It's so cool. Any scene that we're talking about, immediately I get the associated theme of the soundtrack in my head. Mm-hmm. Like, that's how yeah. good the score is. It's, I think it's the best thing about the movie, honestly. No, I agree. I, I, mm-hmm. One thing I really appreciated about the score this time around is how it kind of subtle, subtly in the back of your head, subconsciously helps you keep track of where you are in the story yeah it's like every location every character has their own like light motif or whatever i looked up how many howard shaw <laughs> made for the movie and it's like it's approaching a hundred different like themes uh That's for great. characters and places and moods and themes uh, which does really help because it is there are so many different locations over the course of the trilogy and they're able to use it for like emotional beats and just to keep the story and the m- momentum building. It's so well done mm-hmm. in terms yeah. of that kind of stuff. I do think it is the, it really brings everything together, like the visuals and it adds that sense of like scope and scale with like how, like the, the vocals especially and the use of vocals really add that. It reminds me of yeah. like the Halo soundtrack where it kind of adds that kind of ethereal almost like religious kind of mm-hmm. mysticism to it which i really really like mm-hmm. that kind of ancient thing like i that my favorite sequence is when they go to 
the mine and that just the mine is like its own little side quest of like yeah. a, something in history that's <laughs> yeah. happened and it's just gone so wrong and it's like a a nice little kind of horror beat as well with all the skeletons everywhere and they're just trying to put together the clues and this is in like a, a movie that is <laughs> full of so many different like set pieces and bits of adventure but and they, they were like mm-hmm. different emotional beats and there's just so much to it it's so much fun and i I just love the simplicity of that adventure in the first movie it does kind of feel like a video game i guess i mean that in like a good way like it wasn't about like the plot it was about the exploration and like you know i didn't mind taking my time like exploring this world with these characters it it Mm -hmm. was fun yeah plus some of the cgi from the early 2000s it looked like a video game (laughs) yeah i guess so Yeah. yeah There's a lot of it does hold up really well though. Um, if you take if you take out some of the age CG and kind of weird like green screen stuff, um, compositing and all that kind of stuff, there is mm-hmm. like loads of really good like prosthetic work and uh, mm-hmm. miniatures and yeah, just so much like costumes uh. and there's there's so much to the like dedication to the the visual side of it and a lot of it still looks like really good like the like the wide shots, like establishing shots of a lot of the locations look amazing still. It is yeah. just like the old thing, like um, there's like wolf things in the second movie didn't look the greatest. It's a lot oh, of like yeah. the natural components, like the, the the big monsters and the giant elephants and stuff, mm-hmm. they, they were the most aged aspect to me. Sure. But I think for the most part, there is kind of a timeless quality to when they do keep it simple and you do just have like a, a wizard and a an elf on the screen at the same time there's something mm-hmm. very pure about it yeah i assume a lot of that's taken from the books too like the creatures or whatever so they couldn't like change the designs too much like you know you, you had to put in a giant squid yeah i <laughs> so, guess so even if it looks kind of yeah. bad it's like you gotta we gotta put it in because that's what the book said i really loved the casting also mm. i feel like uh ian mckellen and christopher lee those two are like really yeah, really fun to watch. These were all no names basically when it came out, right? Like, uh, no one not all of them. Elijah Wood was. Yeah. Kate Blanchett's in there. Pretty sure she had. Yeah, that's for Kate Blanchett. Yeah. Was Orlando Bloom big? I don't know if the Pirates I think of the this Caribbean came out yet. Was or... part of what made <laughs> him really big. I don't think Viggo yeah, Mortensen was, was really big before this either. They might have been like just emerging or something. But yeah, Elijah Wood certainly didn't have his name on the map or anything. Elijah Wood's good. He's really good. At yeah, it, very appropriate for the movie and it's kind of like its own weird experience in that way because even in other movies where he is in you don't get that same feel and his eyes are so huge mm-hmm. compared to like the rest they of his head innocent looking <laughs> <bold>. yeah, <laughs> so weird and and as i was mentioning earlier the comparisons with like uh the raimi spider-man trilogy there's a lot of moments in in the lord of the rings trilogy where you get like frodo gets stabbed or something or like he's about to fall over and you get this like slow motion close up of his face and it's kind of funny it's kind of funny <laughs> when he makes certain faces yeah. he's like yeah. in he's the same like way that toby Maguire was hilarious spider. in a lot of the spider-man shots it's, <laughs> it's, just... it's been kind of memed yeah yeah <laughs> i mean al- everything in the lord of the rings trilogy has been memed at this point it's like every so. five yeah. minutes there's another line you i'm like show oh. that yeah it's like it's reverence memes though it's not yeah. like mocking it putting it down oh, of course right, right. right. All right, then keep your it. secrets. Whereas, like, some kind of Suicide Squad, that, that's not yeah. a reference. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's a terrible line. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a Pickle one. Rick moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gravitas was the word I kept thinking of. Like, wow, Ian McKellen really has gravitas. Like, the his ballsy, like, the way they do introduce will introduce these, like, races and locations with this, like, sweeping score and these like huge camera movements it is like it is treating the the material with the kind of respect it deserves and i think it really shows through with the how much work was put into trying to do it justice because i read today stanley kubrick turned down the project oh. like in the 70s or 80s saying that he thought it was impossible to like adapt the story and i think wow. it, it was passed through a lot of filmmakers and because it is considered such a difficult thing to translate to screen yeah so it does take yeah. some some nuts to be able to do it in this kind of a clean way because there are things that are set up in the first movie that are paid off in the third 
and the, there's a lot of details that like really flow together well so as, as, at the same time as each movie standing alone in terms of having their own beginnings middles and endings within the singular movie they also work as one continuous story over the trilogy which yeah. i think is just like such a colossal feat like that that is huge to me mm-hmm. like how they managed to do that it's one of the most ambitious film projects ever it's crazy but they actually did it. We yeah. actually have an example of one that actually worked out because they, <laughs> you see that they started writing it in like ninety seven, so oh, yeah. they spent like four years and they were like writing it as it was going on still. So years of pre production was part of why I think it came together the way it did, yeah. and like the Hobbit didn't because it was like just rushed. You know. Yeah, yeah. of course. Do you so think uh, Peter Jackson like? wanted to do it and then convince the studio to make it or do you think they were going to make it and then just chose him as a director i'm pretty sure it's explained in the behind the scenes stuff how it all came together yeah i didn't Um, have to watch i can't remember he just seems so perfect for it like he clearly has a love for it he clearly read the books and loves this world like it's so it it comes across on the screen yeah it's fascinating all the behind the scenes stuff like seeing peter jackson's like transformation as a, as like a person through them because you can see he like wildly shifts his uh weight around oh yeah so like in cl- some clips he's like really skinny other he's like quite overweight <laughs> like you can really <laughs> see like it it was basically 10 years of his life just about yeah <laughs> dedicated probably, just to this trilogy probably a very yeah. stressful time <laughs> exactly you know, if you're yeah, binge yeah. Eat, incredibly so probably when which uh which which was your favorite character in fellowship mine's mine is boromir yeah <laughs> i think he's an essential character to show and kind of set up that family for a start because his family is set up in one and you kind of see where it goes in the third movie more so mm-hmm. but more that more so him representing the kind of the power greed of man and yeah. i like his his backstory which you, you don't really get in the uh theatrical versions as far as i'm aware you don't get the like flashback scenes with Balmir and his brother and the scenes with their dad um telling him to go back and get the ring or whatever for his his family or and that kind of stuff so mm-hmm. you kind of understand his uh motivations a bit more compared to the theatrical where Balmir is just kind of more simple he's just like a he's basically more of a villain type character he doesn't have the sympathetic slant as much Mm -hmm. he gets a bit of a redemption by the end of his his story but i just like the push and pull type of characters like that so he's my favorite what about you ralph probably i don't know favorite character like Gollum is probably my favorite one of all all the characters in this that stand out he's not even in this one really or or yeah i mean i'm not gonna Um, ask the question every movie we can (laughs) we can include (laughs) the golf (laughs) yeah there's just so many great characters there's so much going on i love the villain Mm-hmm. Uh, Saruman, right? Uh, Christopher Lee. Yeah, very entertaining. He's great. I, I kind of like Gimli. I find him hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> he he is much needed, like comic relief. Oh when man, things get pretty heavy later on. There's quite a few comic relief characters in this movie too. Like Merry and Pippin are comic relief characters. Yeah, yeah. and then Gimli's yeah, also are. there. <laughs> like, they they just show up and. Uh, <laughs> do irresponsible things and <laughs> screw things up for everybody and <laughs> i guess by the end of the story they've kind of redeemed themselves in some way yeah most of the core of the fellowship have some kind of arc i think the first movie does a really good job of like establishing the the importance and weight of everything like you, you get to see they they set a good kind of tone and atmosphere with sauron and that he is something to be feared i really mm-hmm. like the the introduction of the movie where it's just basically a bunch of exposition just setting up the world i think that that intro is so crucial to kind of getting you on board and giving mm-hmm. you like an overview of an understanding of it because if it just started at the at the shire at the beginning you wouldn't immediately care as much or know even where it's going to go possibly yeah you wouldn't get the stakes at all yeah exactly yeah. and they do a good job of making you really fear this this ring the the this macguffin which mm-hmm. you know, like, represents power and the and how addictive it can be, and they, they do a constant good job of reinforcing how it is able to like control people and turn people. And you see, like, with Gollum, it's like the like a worst case scenario type thing, and yeah. 
It's very Everyone powerful. was constantly tempted Even by it. Even the way it. they yeah. shot it and like the design of the ring itself was great. When like, the, the way the design, film was yeah, yeah, like the way the film was letterboxed, it would like perfectly fit into the frame, like the ring. Mm-hmm. It was like an extreme close up on it. Yeah. And it's the, like iconic. devilish chants that play and stuff yeah, when yeah. people are looking at it. They really <laughs> uh-huh. sell the flashes like, tempting to the eye nature of, of, of Sauron. Yeah. Yeah, and the World War imagery as well. Like I really yeah. noticed especially this time. Even like uh, costume design, I've, I've thought Sam in particular, his costume, re- he looks like identical to like a World War I oh, yeah? soldier, I thought. Yeah, with his like backpack and everything. There's just mm-hmm. a lot, like a lot of imagery with like the those gray cloudy skies and the, the doom and gloom of everything is very like what was written mm-hmm. during the time of World War II, wasn't it? So I don't know how there wouldn't be some influence from that bleeding into it especially with the whole like the industrialization angle with the it's more in the second movie with the yeah. ants and the farming and stuff like that they're cutting down all the trees but i think that begins in the first movie with them like making the urukai mm-hmm. by farming all the trees and whatnot so there's a yeah, the, there are a lot that. of themes in the movie uh-huh. to and it's not as obvious as like say something like a fantasy world like harry potter for example where the villain is very clearly like a hitler allegory and i don't know how you could really miss that mm-hmm. <laughs> it is slightly more like vague and fantastical in all the rings you can kind yeah. of project a bit more of what you see in it and interpret it your own way a little bit more than yeah it's a little like more subtle Harry Potter. yeah yeah and like the complexity of it too i think helps like those are like children's books harry potter like i always saw the hobbits as like well, it, like in World War One, World War Two, all the innocent people who were just living their lives were kind of taken out of their innocent lives and put into war and mm-hmm. like these things that they were not prepared for. And that's kind of similar to the Hobbits, how they were just kind of yeah. going about their day. And then they have to take on these like world ending like scenario <laughs> and they have to like bring this ring to fucking Mordor, even though they're not prepared for it at all. Yeah. Like I, I kind of relate. Yeah, the, those Hob- the Hobbits are like completely essential characters. I think. For, yeah, like, they're the heart of the movie. The empathetic side of the movie, yeah, because uh-huh. they like they like just represent pure innocence and like virtue. Yeah. So having them along for the ride really gives you like an emotional point of reference, and especially with one of the greater villains being like an evil version of a Hobbit that's kind of been mm-hmm. warped over hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. And a lot of the other characters, too. Legolas is, like, invincible. He's, like, shooting everyone in the head. So it's <laughs> yeah, nice to have yeah. someone a little more vulnerable to, like, okay, there's more stakes to this. Someone can die. You know? Yeah. <laughs> the rest of those guys were, like, unstoppable, basically. And and with, the like, the lore of the book, and it's explained in the movie a bit, too, but, like, supposedly hobbits are just, like, they're less uh, influenced by the power of the ring, even though, like, obviously throughout the movie, Bilbo and Frodo, they like, it ruins them in a way. But still, mm-hmm. they're not as easily corruptible as like man or even uh, any of the other species that exist in the film. I also didn't know um, up until watching it this most recent time, because I had my <laughs> roommate explain this to me, that the uh, the ring can actually change its diameter and like yes. physically. Yeah, I learned this too. Conform to yeah. So when it like falls off of someone's finger or lands on someone's finger like it's physically trying to do that like it's attempting to do that when i watched it when i was younger i just thought like oh what a wild coincidence that it would land perfectly like that or oh yeah. what a, it, that it would just fall off of his finger but the ring is intentionally doing these things to be found which i found really interesting mm-hmm. I, di- I didn't know until yeah. watching it this time and and it's the reason um frodo carries it on the chain because mm-hmm. it can control its size to make itself bigger or smaller to fall off your finger, but if it's on a chain, it can't. It can't control anything. It can't mm-hmm. fall off his finger. Oh, yeah, that's cool detail there. Yeah, very interesting lore. I also um, definitely want to mention the uh, the riders, those like ghost horsemen that screech or whatever. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> those yeah. things are fucking terrifying. <laughs> cool. And I had the exact. I, I felt like I got a genuine reaction out of it watching it still today in a way that is almost identical to me watching it as a kid and that might just be like a nostalgic kind of response i don't know but i think like especially with the music it's just very very effective the screech that they have yeah it's like piercing it's horrifying yeah they're legit kind of scary 
but I love it. And I love the experience watching it, the experience that I get from those scenes. It's very emotional and you could say epic, <laughs> even if that word has been <laughs> yeah. ruined, but it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is genuinely epic though. Yeah. With the music and everything and the very sweeping epic. shots and yeah, it is just an epic story. Told epically. There's only one more thing I'd say about this one. Mm -hmm. Um and I don't know if it was a problem for you guys, and it was the only one of the three that this happened for me with was I was finding that the audio mixing was kind of a pain in the ass. I had to keep turning it up and down because I was finding the dialogue was really quiet, but the music and sound effects were really loud. Yeah. So I had to I keep had changing too. up and down. They, these yeah. are mixed for a theater too, yeah, exactly. so I get it. Like maybe in a theater environment, yeah. it'd sound fine, but watching it at home, yeah, it's a pain in the ass. It makes me wish they would like remix it or something or offer different. I didn't like, have the same tracks. issue with two and three though. Oh yeah. So no. I don't know what was going on there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I just I, I don't agree know. with you though. I, I I have like a decent home theater setup. I just have the volume pretty loud anyway, so it's not like that big of a deal. I'm usually I don't I don't know, bother changing my, neighbors. my volume a bit. <laughs> I had but... a I had subtitles on. Yeah. Like to help. Yeah, so I, I kept too. it down. Yeah, I like to watch it with subtitles. I'd never done that either. Mm -hmm. It helps like keep track of the the places and the names and all that. You can actually yeah. tell what so they're it's saying. A lot. Yeah, yeah exactly. some of them you can't tell what they're saying. <laughs> I I watch every movie with subtitles that I can at this point because like you don't know what you're missing until you watch with subtitles. Sometimes you'll miss yeah. certain things without subtitles and not know you've missed it, and then watch it with subtitles and be like, oh, that's what they actually said, or like, how come I didn't know this before, sort of thing. So. I feel like it's helpful, which is another mm -hmm. argument for in in support of watching movies at home and not in a theater. Yeah, <laughs> but we'll see. you can get captions in a theater. Yeah, yeah, it's you like can. Some machine. It's right. not as widely available. <laughs> no. All right. What would you give the first film out of ten? I would give it a nine out of ten. It's a easy <laughs> ten for me. Yeah, I would also give it a ten. I'll give this one nice. a 10 out of 10. It's closer to a 10 than a 10, but I'm keeping it at a 10. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do, does one of you want to introduce uh, the two towers? Sure. The two towers. Spoilers. Uh, so what's going on? Um, <laughs> Frodo and Sam are going to Mordor, right? They have the ring and they meet Gollum along the way, who's like, yep. uh, who loves the ring and he's trying to take it from them. And then you got the other guys, Legolas, Aragorn. <laughs> Oregon, whatever the fuck. And you're Aragorn. 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 <laughs> Aragorn. Oregon. Oregon. <laughs> and Gimli. And they're going to some king, King uh, Theoden. And they they go there and they have the Battle of Helm's Deep there. And Gandalf shows up and helps them. That's basically what happens. Mm -hmm. Like the highlight of the movie for me, the most standout moment is Helm's Deep, the Battle of Helm's Deep, which is at the end. Yeah. And yeah. that whole sequence is I agree. It's one of the best battle scenes I've ever seen. It's fucking great. It's a yeah. very lengthy one and it's well yeah. earned, well deserved. Definitely. 100%. The only thing I don't like about that sequence is the constant cutting back to the trees at at one point. I was kind of irritated <laughs> by that. But uh, the sequence yeah. itself which doesn't happen in the theatrical. I really enjoy. Oh, really? Really? Mm -hmm. That was an extended thing. There's way more Ent stuff put in the oh, extended one. Okay, that's why yeah. I felt it this time then. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good to know. In saying that, though, it is a really good follow-up to the first movie. Because in a way, it's kind of the most difficult entry, just from like a story perspective. It's the middle chapter. Like it, It's neither a beginning nor an end. And it doesn't get to have either in the movie, so it has yeah. to be a middle movie that has a satisfying conclusion and that's what the Helm's Deep thing kind of builds up to and gives you a, a huge set piece to base the movie around that increases the epicness each each movie kind of doubles the epicness and scale so <laughs> you, you have this like building yeah, on the sense epic of meter. progression they're introducing things in this movie too they introduce mm -hmm. that whole new kingdom of Helm's Deep they introduce well I guess Gollum is in the first one but he has like actual scenes in this yeah. and they interact with him and it's really that's really good. The seed was planted in the first film, and now uh -huh. something's they probably didn't have the technology to do it well yet, which I guess is a big risk. They didn't even know if Gollum was going to look good. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess so. You know? Yeah, but it look it looks really good. Yeah, how did you feel he held up Gollum mm -hmm. in particular? It's not. I mean, so the, bad I think it looks better in the next one. 
Yeah, the third yeah, film, he looks definitely. the best. There's a bit more detail mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. there in the textures. And it's Andy Serkis's performance that really like pushes it, makes it great. I don't know if they mo-capped his face. I don't know if they have the tech for that yet, but it's like his his physical acting and his voice and everything was just really yeah. great as Gollum. Yeah, so if they didn't mocap it, they certainly used a reference. Yeah, yeah definitely. Well, I've seen the side by side of like him acting yeah. as Gollum or whatever. It's yeah, it's cool. The, <laughs> he does a yeah, good job. The way they integrate him is is very well done on like a technical level, um, mm -hmm. like that that shot where he's like in the water trying to catch a fish and he's like scraping mm -hmm. along the ground and it's the water's oh, yeah. reacting really realistically. It's like a really impressive use of that early kind of cg because mm -hmm. aside from uh some of the more thoughtful shots like that i found that he tended to look a lot better just in terms of like cg quality when they were doing kind of closer up uh, sequences on his face like uh i think it's in the second one where he's like talking to himself and the camera's kind of swinging around and yeah there's two changing from his personalities one yeah. of those scenes in the next movie but also yeah there's one in Two towers. Yeah, yeah, and I remember thinking the the CG animation looked pretty good in the in those moments when some of the other stuffs a bit more aged. I also love just how that scene was shot too, because like I, I'm I'm sure that aspect wasn't in the book of like how it was framed from like a cinematography perspective, yeah. I guess, or how it was shown. I thought that both in this film and the next film, just the way that the internal conflict Gollum Smeagol scenes were filmed was really creative and that it was in those moments where it was like yeah this is Peter Jackson like it, part of his personality kind of shines mm -hmm. through in that yeah it's really clever you stuff. seem to have a lot of fun with Gollum oh yeah because <laughs> yeah. he's such an extravagant character and they kind of gave uh, circus free reign it seemed to capture the the craziness of how when he hundreds of years old as the character is supposed to be he's just this weird freak monster that lived in a cave under underground for like hundreds of years very so he's iconic a bit, he's a bit cuckoo yeah and it's kind of like a a risk being taken when you present a character in that way especially with the voice yeah. you, you don't want it to come off as like Jar Jar irritating, you know? You don't want it to come off that <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's But they still manage yeah. to do something where it's like, okay, that's really weird and strange and higher pitched and all mm -hmm. that. But it's not like ear rape. It's a character no. still. He wanted him to seem very like helpless too. Yeah. Like at times yeah. he can He's be pathetic. very like, please don't hurt me. Yeah. But then he can be very intimidating and scary mm -hmm. when, he, when he wants to be. Because that ring has just dro driven him crazy. It's a great like way to show where the ring can take you if you like yeah, hold on yeah. to it too long. He, he plays yeah. a crucial part in the story with his mm -hmm. dynamic with Sam and Frodo. Because Frodo is kind of instantly sympathetic to him. Not only because of the the stuff Gandalf tells him about yeah. how he used to be like a hobbit. But he, he, do, he does represent what the worst case scenario for Frodo would be. So he feels yeah. like if, if he can protect him and he can like redeem Gollum then there's a chance for him in the end too because he like fears becoming him yeah he has that to believe side. it it's really cool yeah exactly that's why I never have a problem with the whole kicking Sam to the side after he's manipulated in the third movie because mm -hmm. a lot of the discussion I remember when these films were you know more prevalent in the early 2000s was that like yeah Frodo's annoying he just doesn't he doesn't try. He's not doing. He's not a very good hero. Whatever. It's like <laughs> I don't know. I think he did a pretty good job of like with the the weight that he's given of carrying it and like yeah, he's like flawed in ways, but they do a good job of explaining that it's because of the burden he has to carry. Like he still apologizes and when he like yeah. lashes out at people and he's still like a a good person at the end of yeah. it, even with like how how low he's forced to go as part of what makes the story good is it, it is completely about the the power corruption thing and how this just innocent little being is turned into this despite his heart he's turned into this kind of like spiteful selfish creature by the yeah. like the last kind of action scene with the in mount doom or whatever yeah he is being manipulated by both the ring and Gollum at the same time so yeah, he and Gollum is chance, very manipulative. And he's impaled, like yeah, he's impaled what three, two times? <laughs> yeah, over the trilogy, <laughs> like he takes <laughs> a real beating and loses a finger as well. Like, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of interesting setups and payoffs. Some more subtle than others, 
Like the, um, I think it was near the beginning of the movie, they're using the uh, the rope that uh, Galadriel, or Galadriel, I don't remember how to pronounce mm-hmm. her name, that she gave to Sam. And he, you know, during that moment, he was like, oh, can I have something better? <laughs> can I get a sword or some shit? Yeah. But then it turned yeah. out to be very useful, which I, I think is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Magic. These are uh, really violent movies. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> like with the orcs, like they just, there was a point where there's like an orc's hat on a spike or something, but they like decapitate them yeah. or whatever. I guess it's fine because they're orcs. Yeah, so it's, it's weird. Like eating each other, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really gruesome. You're allowed to get away with a bit more when they're not humans, yeah. I guess. As long as they're not strange. people, it's fine. Yeah, very weird. Yeah, they're like evil. It's fine. Yeah, they're birthed in caves. They come out of goo. <laughs> it's gross. You're gross. I thought the <laughs> yeah. the going back to like the effects work, the the way they portray the huge armies for the Helm's Deep sequence looks pretty flawless because they they cleverly kind of disguise the scene with the the rain and the the wind and everything. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's night. Mm-hmm. It covers yeah. it a little bit more, yeah, and it's nighttime. The yeah. visual effects for showing like the large armies in this series, from my understanding or from my memory, like that was pretty unheard of at the time to have so many different yeah, it was. character models within a single frame in a CG environment. Like that was pretty groundbreaking for the time, especially considering how how well it was pulled off and how realistic it did look. Now you see an effect like that, you don't even think twice about it. <laughs> but at the time, that was like yeah, a huge, exactly. a huge deal. Lots of crazy ambition and like groundbreaking things. Yeah, but I think because of that, I think the the Helm's Deep kind of sequence is is actually a, a better action sequence than anything that happens in the following movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> it's that it's that well done that it almost takes some of the the oomph away from the third movie. Cause especially because the the setup and the is so much kind of slower in the way it, it does converge at Helm's Deep and all the separate separate story threads kind of come together at this one place. Yeah, I also remember there's like more supernatural creatures in the third one, like in that battle, like orcs and giants fighting. Yeah, and this was just like stuff. yeah, dragons. Like this is just like I guess they're orcs, but it just looks like two armies of people, a little more grounded. I like the more grounded f- fantasy elements of it. That's why I like Game of Thrones, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I just like the... Yeah, that's why the Helm's Deep battle is so great. One reason why. I love the battle, for sure. Mm. And I love... I, there's there's a bunch in this movie that I do love. And, I, you know, Gollum being explored, stuff like that. But I, in, in terms of, like, my overall investment compared to the other two films, I would say I was the least invested in what was going on in this one. And it might just be because it was like an extended mm-hmm. edition thing, but I'm pretty sure from memory, like two towers out of the three would have been, you know, the least memorable in terms of like what I get out of the experience. Um, I'm less interested mm-hmm. in what the human characters are doing, more interested in like Frodo's thing. And there are parts of the movie where you know it's it's a lot of fun still watching this battle but you kind of like forget about frodo for a bit and coming mm-hmm. back to him i'm i'm much more i guess emotionally invested in what's going on like technically i love what's happening in this film you know the huge battle sequences like there's a lot of elements that come together really well for filmmaking but on a personal i guess emotional investment level the first film and is is a lot better and the third film is slightly better for me in that sense I like the plot, I guess, more. I like I, I didn't like the elf stuff as much as I liked mm-hmm. them going to the Helm's Deep and meeting with King, whatever, and like that whole plot going on. Yeah, it did seem a bit more Game of Thronesy, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I gonna, Before like, Game of Thrones, I don't even watch Game of Thrones, but I kind of felt <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a political way. intrigue angle to it. Yeah, yeah, where like there's this other guy who's taken over for the king. He's like poisoned him or something. I thought that character was kind of one dimensional. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I enjoyed that more than, I don't know, going to Cape Blanchett and talking with the elves. Yeah. <laughs> and then it all yeah, led up sense. to a big battle. We also, I don't know if we mentioned that all of this is shot in New Zealand or like most of it, most mm-hmm. of the series. Mm-hmm. Great like location scouting. Epic scouting. vistas and everything. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I don't know if they like sped up helicopter footage or what, but yeah, they were just like these long sweeping shots where you go like miles across and it was so cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lots of running. Tons Lots of, of running, running, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they do really like establish how much like time and how far they're going. Like uh, I, 
I didn't pick up in the first movie. They say that like uh, in the mines of Moria, they're there for like days. They're traveling through it for days, which is like such creepy. Um, mm. They're just so creepy to imagine. But for me, my biggest problem with the two towers is the semi love triangle thing. That's that's the mm. one thing that I actually just I would happily not be present in the movie and i think it would be better as a result yeah the love triangle with uh frodo sam and Gollum, right <laughs> um no with uh aragorn oh, what's yeah. her name uh b- b- <laughs> she's not which i know yeah first listed <laughs> i mean she's that, the one who says i am no man in the third movie yeah you know, and kills the now school guy yeah that oh, character eowyn yeah eowyn played by miranda otto yeah yeah, her whole segment, um, really. I don't mind, like, I like her place in the story as, like, the woman who wants to fight for what she cares about, but she's, like, not, she's not allowed, basically. So she has to sneak undercover. But before you really get any of that development, she is just kind of pining after Aragorn. And it's, like, a pointless love triangle because <laughs> Aragorn, like, really doesn't give a shit about her. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's not even tempted by her at all. Like it, mm-hmm. in the in the extended version, there's that scene where she like gives him some soup, and he's like so disgusted by it, trying to be polite, <laughs> spits it out, and tries to throw it on the ground. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> so it's like I, I don't understand the point of that love triangle kind of tease. To be uh-huh. honest, yeah, I, I think okay. it doesn't hold hold that much importance in the story because especially in the third one, she just moves on instantly and goes out with Boromir's brother anyway. <laughs> It seems like they just wanted to give us something to do. Mm-hmm. How about uh, the return of Gandalf? That's a big part of this movie. We find out he was fighting a hell monster. Yeah. He, he fell down with the hell monster and then he fought it with They're a like sword. They're like gods, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty like cool. Fighting. That always used to confuse me when I was like a kid. I didn't really <laughs> understand. Uh-huh. The, did like, people, wait, so he were did, they surprised he by that? Like, they spoiled it, it in the trailer. I remember yeah, that being I remember like, uh, thing okay. at the time. I, was gonna I just wanted to know what, to what confirm, people were thinking that, at the yeah. time. It's like, you gotta watch this movie, Gandalf's back. Is this Gandalf supposed to be like a white. Jesus thing? Like a resurrection thing? Yeah, he's like, he's like, he's like Neo yeah, in the second Matrix movie. Well, when the shot when he returns is like sunlit behind him, you can't see his face or anything. That's partly because they want you to think it's Saruman, but there's <laughs> also like a Jesus, like, Saruman like too. Christ element. I was yeah, like, that was interesting. That? His, it's like they melted them? from Saruman's audio to like Ian McKellen. Yeah. Like, it was really interesting how they did that. But it's like, why did the character do that? Why, why, why are you trying sure, to be a dick but it was to, to like, make your friends think that it's the Saruman? Audience, yeah. <laughs> He's being a massive troll. It was cool. Like, this is not the time. They shot at you. What if they actually killed him? <laughs> that would be, be an unfortunate ending. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like i kind of i like his like prophetic role in the story though with him being yeah. he's kind of brought back from the dead but it it's not the same as well, it's actually really similar to like a story thing in game of thrones where there's mm-hmm. like a character that keeps being brought back by like the ethereal gods and you have like yeah. one the purpose yeah. and you have to complete that purpose then you go like kind of back to where you came I like that aspect in terms of the fantasy stuff because they you have to have a character that can dump some kind of exposition so you have any clue as to like what's going on so having this all-knowing kind of wizard character is quite essential to just keeping you up to speed because he actually knows what's happening in the world so he can yeah. provide some answers. Yeah, I exactly. I like the purpose he serves in the story. But I prefer Gandalf the Grey as a character. I felt like he was much more, yeah. he had a bit more like charisma to him. He was a bit more like playful. This one, he's kind of like almost too serious at points as a character. Still mm-hmm. like him, mm-hmm. but prefer the Grey boy. Yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> How about the trees? Yeah, the Ents. We haven't talked about the Ents. No, we haven't at all. Do you think the CG on them is kind of dated? Yeah. I, it's still nothing yeah. as bad as like the, the tentacle monster. But <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. It's, I'd it's say the most aged sure. part of the Ents visual effects are the close ups on Merry and Pippin when they're on that kind of yeah. tree animatronic thing where they've CG'd the face. There's just something about the like backgrounds and the way it's moving, it all looks quite weird to me. Yeah, mm-hmm. the, it's the way to, that it's like, lit also together. kind of just seems <laughs> weird. Yeah, it's the most janky part of the trilogy to me. Right. It's the Ent stuff. Right. Yeah, I don't, okay. I didn't I didn't enjoy so much of it being in this movie, but so I guess I might if I ever next time I watch the trilogy, I might just do the normal edition, the theatrical edition for this movie. I don't know. 
don't know how much they'd be missing. Yeah, but I, I, I think they don't have, like, that really good burial scene where the king is oh, yeah. like reminiscing about how it, no parents should have to bury their child. I've mm-hmm. always liked that scene, but I think that's only in the extended. Okay. Mm-hmm. So there's a bunch yeah, of stuff like that. Where it's like, I almost wish I could just tick like down a list of the extended <laughs> scenes I want Make your own and edit. watch my own version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which people have done, I'm sure. Yep. Yeah. You can definitely do that. Uh, I was going to say there's a, there's a really funny line <laughs> from, uh, <laughs> Saruman just pacing around by himself and he's like Gandalf the white Gandalf the fool and it's just like (laughs) kind of lame but really funny even the cheesier parts of these movies I still love in the exact same way as like the Raimi Spider-Man trilogy because it's like the Mm -hmm. the cheesiness is like more acceptable I feel or maybe it's just nostalgia yeah because like, like I don't know how you can sell like a fantasy universe without having a bit of you know silliness in there (laughs) like if it was taken so seriously to the point where there's no levity that's when you kind of start to laugh at it you know Mm -hmm. yeah i guess getting back to the the big fight scene stuff that spans over quite a long time in the film like there's a there's a good build up to it i feel like the movie is you know slowly slowly building up to it and then when it happens it's like okay well this is actually something it's not just like a tiny little thing at the end and there's a few different elements that i really like about it i i really enjoyed you know the the sequence where you're watching these children gearing up to battle and like putting on like uh very well but one yeah 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 that was that had like an emotional impact there. Although you didn't really see them in the battle, it was just them gearing up the battle. They probably all died within the first ten seconds off screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on a, on a lighter note, the uh, the kill count competition between Gimli and uh, Legolas, yeah. I find very amusing, <laughs> and that's something that I definitely remember being a child watching that, and that's something that stuck with me. This movie has some really good miniatures in it. Oh yeah, um, in particular miniature effects like when in the battle of helm's deep when the bomb goes off Mm -hmm. that like destroys the wall i just really like how that looks that's always looked really good to me and the same with when the ents are like pulling down the dam yeah and the way the the water like flows through it doesn't look like cg water because it actually built this huge like miniatures are great dam thing yeah they just always look amazing more movies use miniatures because they work really well Mm -hmm. It's like, why why create something artificially in CG when you can just create in real life on a smaller scale and it's real, you know? Mm-hmm. Very effective a lot of times. That's time. another thing I find confusing about, like, in, in the first movie, there's that scene where um, the elf makes the water turn into, like, a bunch of charging horses. Oh, yeah. And I, I thought the effects there looked pretty good, to be honest. Pretty mm-hmm. good for the time. Yeah, like, some of this stuff from so long ago looks... As good as it does, I guess a, a big part of it is just art direction and mm-hmm. you know the, the the detail of all the paintings and the they went and got these like concept artists who've worked on like the series for like decades and stuff like that. So yeah. there's like an authenticity to a lot of it, and just how it's coordinated and storyboarded in terms of like which shots are going to be CG and which ones aren't and which parts of yeah no each the storyboarding is actually a good shout because it is. I find it especially apparent in the first movie, mm-hmm. um, just how well put together, just the visual side of it is. Yeah, mm-hmm. it yeah, has to be really, like classic that stuff. well coordinated, or else it's just not going to work. You can't just mm-hmm. you can't just like figure out which shots you're going to get on the day. <laughs> yeah, you like can't you can with some it. movies. There's so much going on. Yeah, yeah there's like eighty characters you got to follow. Gigantic. And it, it all it all comes together. Yeah, and I mean because of that, there are some moments where there's like continuity errors or whatever just because it's like okay yeah they had so many different days of shooting like (laughs) this is probably like a week later or something like i think it was um Mm -hmm. pippin or mary which one of them when they're like running around escaping from the orcs or whatever they are and uh crawling around with their hands tied and then the horse is about to stomp on him and he's like no Mm -hmm. but his arms are like spread out to the side i'm like but your arms were just tied. It's not like it matters a lot. <laughs> that was yeah. one that stuck out. There was also... Um, Does he not cut it on a axe or something? Or is that the other no, one? they do after the fact. 
Because then when it comes back to it, it starts with the like uh, arms to the side, and then they crawl away and then cut it. It's 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 not it doesn't ruin the movie. Obviously, I'm not trying to make it a big deal. (laughs) Another little tidbit, fun fact that I'm sure has been repeated many times on Reddit. Uh, when Viggo Mortensen kicks the helmet, oh, yeah. when he's like pissed off, he's like, ah! That's him breaking his toe, and they kept the take, supposedly. His like genuine vis- <laughs> yeah. visceral reaction. Really? Yeah. You can tell he's like screaming in pain. <laughs> <laughs> I find that funny. <laughs> yeah, that is funny. Yeah, because not only is there the, this huge plot going on, but this one does have the tracking aspect with the like flashbacks and everything. Mm hmm. At the, at the beginning yeah. of the movie where Aragorn's trying to find the hobbits and you like think they're dead for a bit and they're not. Yeah, there's a lot of like different in- intrigue going on because it all comes together with like three climaxes at the same time all happening in different yeah. places. Like you got the Helm's Deep victory, you got the Ents destroying the the castle and you have um, Sam's speech. That's what I just boil it down to. He's got that kind of emotional yeah. speech while the... They show the the victory and implant a bit of hope on the, in the hopelessness that is to follow, and also kind of like solidifying just how essential of a character he is too. Mm. Like this this is the movie where it's yeah. like okay, Sam is crucial to the story. Like you can't remove him. Like the story does not work without him. He's not just there's so many movies yeah. where it's like you have a sidekick character and they kind of force in some way that they're essential, but it's not really like. But this one, he actually feels like an absolutely necessary character, and I like that mm-hmm. about this. They are quite good with that overall. Like there, there isn't much that could be trimmed out. A lot, yeah. Of it. Like most people have an important role to play. This uh, this movie was the first out of the three that uh, used a Wilhelm scream. From what I could tell. <laughs> oh, yeah. Another that was great. Two thousand ism. Yeah, yeah. I remember noticing that. Are you <laughs> glad they didn't change the title? Because, of course, this came out one year. Oh, after yeah, I guess this was a controversy. Yeah. It was a big controversy. They thought they were pro- like capitalizing on the fact that, yeah. Twin wow, Towers that's funny. Went down. But that's just the name of the book, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, that was just the <laughs> so, name. Yeah. Sorry. Exactly. I'm glad they didn't. Cause, what did I they mean, want to change it to? Yeah. Yeah, what could you change it to the i feel like now they would give in and do it a bunch of people would go on twitter and they'd give in yeah i don't know maybe <laughs> maybe yeah. you never know it's so coincidental though it's not like these like uh movies about earthquakes or whatnot and then there's like a horrible earthquake in japan type thing it's yeah like a... there's nothing in the movie that's like has to do yeah. with that <laughs> yeah it's like a fantasy movie there was definitely a uh reddit post of just an an image of someone holding their ticket stub and it was for lord of the rings the the two towers and i think it might have been i don't know like 2009 or something it was just re-releasing at a a theater they just decided to play it and the uh the date of the screening was on september 11th and the post read what a weird date to to play this movie but go off i guess (laughs) (laughs) like found that kind of amusing (laughs) all right um yeah. Anything? Yes, that's two towers. Yeah, I guess. I yeah. guess that is uh, the two of the towers. What would you give it? Nine out of ten. Same as the other one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I give it a a ten again, but it's the one I'm most critical of. I think if I if it's it might be closer to a a nine than a ten. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm uh, torn between a seven and an eight. I'm not sure. Least invested in this one out of all of them. But mostly just for personal reasons. I think, like, I don't know, on a technical level, it's, it holds up pretty well. But I think just pacing-wise, I'm not as into it as the other ones. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, seven, seven I have a feeling the shorter version might be the better version of Two Towers. Because yeah. I felt it drag a bit more, too. But yeah. I don't know how fair it is to just judge it on one. I don't know. Yeah, it takes mm-hmm. a while to get there. There's a lot of build-up. Hmm. I don't know if this one got any Oscars. I know the next it one. It was nominated. Gets, I don't uh, think like it. Like everything it was nominated for. Yeah. yeah, it got all of them. What, the next one. And the first one got a few. Yeah. yeah. All right, Alex, do you want to introduce uh, Return of the King? Okay. Let's talk about the third in the trilogy, the Kappa, the Return of the King, 2003. The longest one of the three. The special edition is, what, four, four hours, hours something? <laughs> And exactly. Four three hours, three hours twenty one. So. Yeah, it's like three hours of credits though. Yeah, true. There's no way to avoid a, a huge movie 
either way. But yes, yeah, the it's the Kappa. It it kind of starts showing uh, Gollum's backstory, which I always forget is how the how the movie opens, and I'm always yeah. nicely surprised because it's a nice nice little story to kind of remind you and get things flowing again. But it, yeah, it's about the the ultimate destruction of the ring with the Frodo and Sam storyline and their journey coming to an end with all that conflict. And I guess the other major part is the lots of fighting, lots of wars, the war for Gondor and Aragorn reclaiming the throne is the other major beat. It isn't, it's not in the three story thing, I don't think, in the, quite the same way. It kind of branches out again, so you've got lots of little conflicts going on within battles and stuff like that. There's lot, there's lots going on with like Boromir's father and his weird preferential treatment. Like he hates um, Faramir, mm-hmm. who is, we forgot to mention, I guess, in the second movie. Yeah, uh, Boromir's brother, who is, yeah, he's like the redheaded stepchild, even though he is blood and he's just yeah. treated like shit by his dad. The unwanted um, child. Which is a sad little bit. There was a really funny yeah. meme posted on the uh, <clears throat> posted. <clears throat> Got to clear my throat. I'm sorry. There was a really funny <laughs> meme posted on the uh, Lord of the Rings memes subreddit that I discovered <laughs> the other day, and it was just like. Mm. Images of of like the breakfast that uh, he would give to Boromir versus uh, Faramir. And oh, I think just, I saw that. Oh, it was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even describe it. Just look it up. It's probably still like top post right now. Anybody listening? Even though it's a week yeah. after we talk about it. But yeah. So where does this one kind of? Well, there's there's not much else to the story. Is there? It's just kind of the Kappa. They 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 achieve their journey and everyone completes their arc mm-hmm. if they have one yeah. set up. And there's lots of fights. Lots of fights. <laughs> lots of fights. And then lots of satisfying, like, goodbyes. Yeah. The whole, like, last hour of the movie is them, like, all resolving their stories, <laughs> basically. It just keeps going and going and going. Yeah, it was this one where I really noticed the the horror influence we kind of talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. With, like, the whole spider sequence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's yeah, like a, that one. De- a definite kind of horror thing. Um, they like all actually have quite a lot of horror elements. Like in the second one, we didn't mention that creepy scene where Frodo like falls in the water, and there are all these like oh, yeah. beings the that are like grabbing at him, <laughs> stuff like that. Those are things that would freak me out as a child. Yeah, I remember freaking me out, and just the there's a lot of payoffs in Return of the King. Um, my mm-hmm. favorite being when Gollum gets the ring. I think that's quite a powerful mm-hmm. moment with the like all the sound just is bored down into that like that piece of music. Yeah, it's like in his eyes, like nothing, nothing is important aside from that he finally achieved his goal and the irony of him kind of destroying the ring through yeah. just <laughs> the addiction it's side of it. It's the most appropriate yeah. way to end the story. I could not think of a better mm. way to do it to still have that kind of like success within the goals that are trying to be achieved by the characters but not just have it be this like sappy like yeah we did it and nothing went wrong sort of thing and it doesn't feel unjustified yeah. when things go wrong and it's it's interesting how it plays out too i, I find it very appropriate it's kind of like bittersweet yeah. in a sense yeah and i liked the... Gollum too it was a nice moment I'm like oh he deserved it bud he's a really yeah, interesting character because you, do, <laughs> yeah, you don't he really it. he's not a mustache twirling villain villain no not Gollum. at all He's very you'd completely understand why he is the way he is, even yeah. though he is kind of evil. He's got more mm-hmm. internal conflict than the majority of villains that exist. Yeah. He's like trying to see. Yeah, he, he's... he's battling himself too. He's not just being battled by other characters. Mm-hmm. No, it's really interesting. And that That's definitely the strongest part of the movie to me, is the uh, Sam, Frodo, Gollum yeah. final part of the journey with the whole like lying about well, the manipulation angle is really fun with Gollum kind of framing mm-hmm. Sam and getting him to go yeah. away so you can have the hero moment for Sam where he he really does save the day. Like, without him, they they would have been completely fucked. And then he just <laughs> carries him up the fucking mountain. Yeah. Yeah, and he, he even carries the ring for a bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a nice little reveal. He's like, they've taken the ring. He's like, no, I took it. But it makes sense, <laughs> yeah. too. He's like, I thought you were dead. Uh-huh. So. Yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think this spider thing held up? Visually? I mean, it's still creepy yeah. as fuck. It's, it she works well. Yeah. I mean, it's it's great for its time for animation. Mm-hmm. I don't really have an issue with it at all. Yeah, it was fine. Yeah, no, I, I like the spider sequence. It's 
in this one the most aged thing to me was were the the big elephants in the mm. big war sequence because mm -hmm. it's it, it's already such a huge battle and it's kind of crescendoed at a certain point they kind of focus on this like really ugly orc who's this general or something his commander <laughs> um, and you focus on them for a while and then the one army clashes into another and then the ele elephants show up and then you have the kind of deus ex machina of the movie the 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 zombie horde thing oh yeah and yeah. if I had to if I had to point at anything, that's my least favorite part of Return of the King. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a pretty common complaint. Is just I really wish those seeds were sown a bit earlier or something. Because for a movie that does have so many good like, or for a, a trilogy of movies that has yeah. such good like setups and payoffs over the three, I really wish there was some way it could have been sown a bit earlier, so it doesn't just feel like well, this this it does just kind of come out of nowhere, um, mm -hmm. and then saves the day for them. Do you not feel that way about the ends though? Because they, they um, seem kind of comparable. Just like how they're showing up it, in the story. It feels to the same. Yeah? Yeah, because the, the Ents and the way that the, the whole story of the second one is is basically justifying why the Ents are there and why their involvement is kind of forced. Mm -hmm. Which I guess is kind of similar. It's, it makes sense to me that like they're always going through woods and there are trees everywhere that like magical tree creatures being involved in this is not that strange to me. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it is about the zombies and the... Yeah, I don't know. It, it's just a preferential thing, I suppose, with him, like, convincing them and then them saving the day. Yeah. It's just a time thing, I think. It happens quite quickly. It's a bit mm -hmm. better in the extended version because they, they kind of linger around and set it up a little bit more. But, again, it's just like, well, I, I know they're coming, so I, there's not much tension for me like there is in the Helm's Deep one as much. Like I really feel like a lot of people are are really losing in that Helm's Deep fight, and I'm not waiting for some ghosts to show up. Yeah, and then they just don't use them at the end. They're like, you can go. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. Like when when they when they show up and save the day, and then they've got to like explain why they can't keep using them, and they've got to like go their own way because they've you know it's just like the fantasy stuff. I usually like start checking out on. Mm -hmm. in like fantasy universes when they get to like this degree but yeah, yeah that makes it, sense it doesn't ruin it for me but it's just like a, yeah okay like, let's just get past this so we can get to the more satisfying stuff for me the only part of this movie that felt like kind of unnecessary for me was just like a tiny tiny thing not the not the opening scene flashback with Gollum and Schmeagol but when later on I mean not even that much later I think like maybe 20 minutes later or something Gollum says Schmeagel did it once he can do it again like referencing to killing them and then oh, it the flashes flashback. back yeah. again and it's like eh, we saw that but yeah I thought the same thing <laughs> yeah like it, it, everybody would know what you're talking about hopefully but there is there is another thing that really bugs me about this trilogy it's such a minor like nitpicking detail that I, I don't I can't say I would have noticed otherwise but for not watching the behind the scenes stuff but now that I know it it really bugs me every time I watch it and that's the whenever they have a, a shot of someone underwater they're not really underwater so they have these like CG like mm -hmm. bubbles coming out of their nose and mouths and not I never really. noticed it until it was pointed out in the special features but yeah I didn't notice it either now when I watch it like it, it's really recognizable <laughs> to me and it really bugs me now I'll me. never unsee it oh no yeah. Oops. <laughs> that's yeah. it just ruined, ruined it, it for everyone <laughs> <laughs> even in that, that that like ghost scene there's still some there's still some enjoyable moments there like when the skulls are falling down yeah and, I like the skulls yeah, yeah I like the skull bit I like when Gimli's trying to blow away the ghost hand it's just like it's a fucking bug or something <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a funny moment i think it was about in the second movie where just like i got to the point where like every time it showed gimli on screen i was just thinking like i could just re-edit this movie and add like a wet fart sound every time he he was on screen <laughs> and it would it would have like <laughs> more or less the same kind of tone for him appearing on the screen just, just, just like cut to him he, he does big fart. does he have a, he has a burp scene doesn't he like a belch scene in the drinking contest. Oh, I think so. so you get yeah. a burp. No <laughs> thought there, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's a funny character. Um, so what do you guys think about the... There, there's a very common criticism of this movie where when I first heard it, I was like, okay, yeah, I guess that makes sense. But now after watching the trilogy again recently, 
I don't know if the criticism holds that much weight. People say, uh, like, why didn't they just, why didn't they fly to Mordor with the birds from the end of the movie? Oh, the they eagles. could have skipped the whole, yeah, the eagles. They could have skipped the whole journey mm-hmm. and made it easier. I don't know. I, after watching the trilogy recently now, it's like, I'm, I had that in the back of my mind and I noticed other parts in the movie where it's like, yeah, but they're also, the enemies are flying too. And there's points where they have to like hide down low so that they don't get spotted by like their yeah. scouts and like all that stuff. So I think they probably would have just been obliterated if they took a straight path using a using an eagle to get there. Like they they don't address it early on or anything, but still I I don't, I don't know if that would have worked out the way that some people pretend it would. Yeah, there are like some logical yeah. things that would be like first off the eye surely would see them yeah. from like anywhere. So like anything mm-hmm. that goes near it they make a good point of showing that like this horrible beam can spot you from anywhere. Yeah. And like um by the by the third movie, one of the bigger like antagonists being Saruman is dead. And he seemed to have like a big a big role in terms of like the, the enemy's power, like using those crows to spy on people and using magic to create in the mountains the snow to cascade down and everything like mm. Oh yeah, and then he's he's out of the picture by the third one, so that might make a difference. That, yeah, like that. That's really not on my mind when I'm watching the movies, to be mm-hmm. honest. What was your favorite scene from this movie? Um, I have a couple, but there's a there's a particular moment I really like. Mm-hmm. Um, just for the execution of it, it's kind of like an action moment where Gandalf goes out on his own. Well, he's not on his own. I think he has the Hobbit on the horse with him, but he goes out on his own. Um, and kind of saves the soldiers that are just being tormented by one of those flying beasts. Mm. And the the score plays this really cool song as he holds up the stuff, and there's like the that like ultra wide shot of the beam coming out of his. Um, it just looks like a piece of concept art, basically, of the wizard uh, holding back the the dragon. It's just mm-hmm. like a really memorable, burned into my brain piece of imagery. What about you, Ralph? I don't know. Through the end, probably yeah. <laughs> with Frodo and Gollum and all them in Mordor. Yeah, we bow to no one's a pretty good bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the battle's great. It's not as good as Helm's Deep for me personally, but you know, one one sequence that stuck out for me, it's kind of like a transitionary sequence, was uh, when they were lighting the fires over the mountains, and we got oh, this yeah. like long. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I loved the music there. I loved the emotional impact. I thought that that was like. Really well presented, really good ideas yeah, going moment. into that. Yeah, it's fucking when things come together in this in this trilogy, like when things are building up, like when Gandalf shows up with uh, you know, a bunch of people to save the day at any given moment in time. Like all <laughs> the emotions that are building up, it's just executed so well. You don't get that mm-hmm. in a lot of other movies, and I think yeah. part of what helps it is the length and and just how many things are happening that when things build up it is cu- cumulative in a way and there's much more of an impact yeah and because they're being set up and paid off at different times like you get them constantly mm-hmm. different payoffs at yeah, certain exactly. times in the movies there's a yeah. lot of like depth to the world and to the storytelling of it and the music too like you said the, the, the music, music is yeah yeah it brings that really it all together helps for too. sure uh-huh when i was under the impression that uh Amazon was remaking this story all I was thinking was like you can't make the music better there's room for improvement yeah on mm-hmm. every other aspect but you cannot make the music better it's not possible yeah they you have can't to improve the same that. music yeah that's if, why I can't really be that. it would have to be set in like I don't know the same world as Peter Jackson's movies but like something like that where they use mm. the same music and it feels like part of those movies I feel like that's the way to make it work who was it Howard Shore yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe they can, maybe get, they can get them back. That'd yeah, be great. that'd be cool. Yeah, would not and make new complain. stuff. But it could be like uh, with the Star Wars movies, like John Williams' music is kind of whatever for yeah. those, the the new ones. I mean, yeah, true. Uh, more the, of it. the ones he made for Disney, they're like fine, but there's not like it's not <laughs> it's not like the Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. They really raise the stakes. <laughs> With each movie, and in, in this one, we got two Wilhelm screams. That was the most <laughs> Wilhelm screams out of all of the movies. First zero, then one, then two. So they're really, yeah, really raising the stakes. 
Why two? Come on, Peter. <laughs> one is one is too much already. Two Wilhelm screams in one movie. I did notice in this one it was where the Peter Jackson we kind of know now seemed to be coming out a oh, bit yeah. more. Where he's clearly more comfortable with the like epic scale of the CG and everything. So you mm-hmm. have stuff that like he clearly really wanted to to be in the movie, like like the Legolas taking down the <laughs> the elephant by himself yeah. type stuff like that's yeah some fun cheesy maybe a little like, more like, indulgent maybe yeah that's one word for it but at the same time yeah. it, it it does make sense to have the third one be the most grand the like grandiose one like right. just so you have some progression over the trilogy uh-huh. so that and that's especially hard too much that's hard yeah. with like these first two movies that are so epic already yeah i get that but like all of his movies have this indulgence or i don't know if that's the right word but they feel like king kong is three and a half hours long and like yeah. the hobbit movies each of them is like three hours long and it, it just gets to yeah. a point where it's like it, i don't even know if he could tell a story in an hour and a half he just it's there's so much there's so much going on mm-hmm. i don't know i feel like it's a gradual thing because I, I don't yeah i don't feel that indulgence in the first movie and it's just a little bit there in the second movie and then it's a bit more there still in Return of the King, and then by the time you get to King Kong and the fucking Hobbit movies, it's kind of <laughs> yeah. in full effect. It's not distracting at all in these. Like, I would never criticize these for that. Mm. I actually like those moments just fine. Yeah, the but, action's really good for the most part. Yeah, it is there. It is like, we're watching a four-hour-long movie. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. One thing I do want to shout out is is how strong the like architecture and like design of the world is. Mm-hmm. Like it, It's, it's yeah. so memorable like every location has such a strong visual style oh, to yeah. it that really does help like in the third movie a lot of the scenes are set in like the, the city in gondor that big white city like in the middle like yeah where all the wars the the battle scenes are set it's just such a striking piece of imagery with the with the, the like dying tree at the top and mm-hmm. there's so much cool stuff like that Powerful imagery goes a long way. One of the most memorable mm. parts of the first movie for me was quite literally just like when they're on the two boats and they see the two statues with their hands, like yeah. basically saying like stop or whatever. It's like that visual is just so powerful and resonating that, you know, like even before watching it again, it's like that. that's just something that stuck with me from being a kid even though the, the, you know there's nothing like insane or crazy that's happening in that scene there's not like a fight scene or anything they're just going mm-hmm. to another location but everything coming together especially with the music it's just it leaves an impression they do really l- let the world breathe and yeah. it feels like it it's existed for a long time before these characters yeah. have been in it they do a really good job of that over the whole trilogy actually like the, the first movie has the the trolls that have turned to stone and the third movie has that really nice little moment where they find the statue that's head mm-hmm. has been knocked off and the the like weeds have grown into like a crown for the king and stuff like that there's loads of nice quiet moments like that it's one of the most consistent fictional universes from what i can tell i mean i haven't read the books but so from what i can tell well, <laughs> but it, yeah, it feels can, that you can way just for see sure. how influential it is how it just bleeds into all other especially fantasy like works from the last like hundred years you, you just can't escape yeah. it did anybody uh have the uh kind of like the bed scene at the end ruined for them a bit by this hilarious youtube dub that, that was really popular after the movie came out no i, uh, haven't seen I remember this. it so yeah. funny yeah. It, everything is memed from the movies yeah. that... <laughs> that's a particularly so funny popular one. yeah yeah it's just they, they basically somebody redubbed that that bed scene and just made it so much more awkward and, <laughs> and like homoerotic <laughs> as if yeah. frodo and sam yeah. weren't already homoerotic enough in the movies but uh yeah yeah just dubbed over it and it's it, I just look it up it's hilarious and every time i watch the movie now i think of that and it's kind of funny i mean it's goofy on its own either way it's not like the most serious scene that's ever existed so it's not like completely ruined but it's kind of funny mm-hmm. yeah the dialogue's really good really yeah. memorable like a really poetic in a lot of ways yeah purposeful. they seem to have taken like a lot of dialogue from the books obviously which like why would you not if you have, have this source material like and it it really it really flows nicely with the way that the what they chose to put in there, mm-hmm. and how they define the characters. Mm. 
Did we have to talk about the ending? Yeah, what about like, the other major criticism people always spout for this movie, saying that it's got so many endings, it just never ends. <laughs> yeah, which I kind of criticized it too. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not that bad. It really isn't. Um, and it's good to see everyone wrapped up well. It's better than not seeing them wrapped up at all mm-hmm. or like for it to be not satisfying. But, I mean, it's a lot. It, it goes on. You think the movie's over and then it fades out and it keeps going. <laughs> You're like, holy shit. I can yeah. imagine being in a theater and being annoyed. It feels somewhat appropriate, <laughs> though, given how yeah. long the trilogy is anyway. Yeah, that's the way I see it. If it's like 12 hours, if half an hour of the 12 hours is just like wrapping it up, that yeah. seems reasonable to me. It's proportional. Yeah, exactly. You got to end a lot of and different the, things. And the, the extended version of the third one, it seems like one of the more essential ones, to be honest, because you don't have the Saruman being killed scene so you just don't Mm -hmm. know what happens to saruman and there's there's a bunch of other stuff with like the ending there's way less like clarity um and like explanation of what's going on there i know the mouth of sauron bit um isn't in there because it Mm -hmm. it kind of that actually kind of serves no no plot purpose because in the book you're supposed to think that frodo is dead at that moment Mm -hmm. and that and they're they're reporting that to aragorn and everyone so you as the like reader or viewer know that he could possibly be dead, but in this version of it, we know that he's alive, so it's, mm. it is a pointless scene for the most mm. part. I feel like I've seen a lot of characters designed that way, too. The, like, helmet covering everything but their mouth sort of thing. I feel like I've seen that in a bunch of other things. Yeah, and he's just instantly killed anyway. Yeah, he's a strange character. <laughs> in seconds. Did you feel as yeah. though um, the the scene in the uh, at the end where he throws the ring down and they're in the the mountain... Was it Mount Doom? Was that what it was called? Was it, it Mount sounds Doom? Sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When they're in there, love the scene, but feel like the kind of environment is a bit lacking compared to every other scene in the whole trilogy. Really, like th- there's like some sort of environment there. This one just felt mostly. It was a little bit too much green screen for me in terms of what was there. Like I don't know how they would have pulled it off it. otherwise. Yeah. When they're inside. It just felt a bit more right. artificial of an environment compared to the rest of the trilogy, which, you know, even if there are computer generated elements, like usually there's something there to kind of, you know, latch it down <laughs> into reality. I don't know. It's a, it's still right. a really good yeah. scene, but like just felt more George Lucasy in that moment. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just the being inside a volcano thing. Like it's just going to be so... It requires so many visual effects yeah. either way. <laughs> it's just lava everywhere. All right. Anything else you wanted to say about uh, the no, films? All right. That's it. I think we were pretty harsh on this one. <laughs> I still think it's great. That's yeah, the thing. Like, great. You have to remember the context yeah. of I've seen these movies so many times. It's taken me a long time to figure out the things that I, I don't like about it as much. Because exactly. I, I never used to really like even think about it. I just watched them. You're being <laughs> a little more were. thorough than... <laughs> Yeah, I'm just Maybe. thinking about yeah. them in terms of like, yeah, just the structure. And I was thinking about th- that love triangle thing, especially annoyed me because I saw how they took that element from Lord of the Rings and forced it into the Hobbit story as well. <laughs> um, that really yeah, like, bothers me. Like it worked so well, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. All right, I get that. Okay. Well, what would you give it out of ten? Nine out of ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I give them all tens. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, g- I give them all nines. Yeah, and I'm giving this one an eight out of ten. And I want to give all of them tens. And I currently have them all rated as ten on IMDb because I rated them a long time ago, and my IMDb account's very old. But I might change it to reflect the individual film's rating. But at the same time, I almost feel like it's a part of a greater experience. Like the second and third movie don't really exist without the first one. Yeah, you know? they don't stand on their own at all, and, really. And, like, yeah, I, I like, couldn't enjoy them on the same way. Yeah, I, I often like uh-huh. to rate the individual movies within something that feels like it's actually a, a part of a greater whole. I like to rate them as like the whole experience for me. Mm-hmm. And yeah, in that's that sense, how it's like it. close to a 10 at least for like yeah. the overall experience. For me, the whole experience was like a 9 out of 10 all the way through. Mm-hmm. So they were like yeah. low points, maybe toward the third one. You know, 
I, maybe I wasn't the biggest fan of like the first half of Fellowship. Like once everything came together and the Fellowship started, I got a little more into it. And my axe. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just liked meeting all of them. Yeah. So, all right, awesome. Is it the best trilogy? It? it might be. Um, I'm trying to think of a better trilogy, honestly. Yeah, it's up Other there. Other than definitely. like Madagascar, maybe. Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> I have a trilogy to recommend that that's up there. Mm-hmm. I won't say. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, let's do some questions then from the Sard community. If you want to leave your own questions, head over to the Sardonica subreddit where there will be a suggestion thread where you can ask us whatever you like. Let's start with this one from uh, Pike and Shot 1618, who says, How often do you guys visit the Sardonica subreddit? All the time. They <laughs> tend to look a couple times a day. Yeah. When it's fairly the, active, when and the despite the uh, constant nostalgia critic spam, it's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there's new memes of like using the intro gunshot, <laughs> splicing yeah. it with another yeah. meme. That's pretty funny. They used a <laughs> clip from my review of Gotti. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Where Antonio gets shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I find Reddit to be a good tool to engage with a community. And it's, you know, it's nice it's to have filter, something yeah. that is also curated by the community. So you yeah, can understand, yeah. at least for the Reddit portion of the community, you can understand popular sentiments or, you know, requests. And it's it's a good way to get someone's attention if the community uh, collectively decides that it's something that would want attention, you know? Yeah, fair enough. I'm on, I'm on Reddit, usually before I try to fall asleep <laughs> or something the end of the day sometimes when i just wake up but then most of the day i'm just like editing but okay nico liberty says what are your favorite slash most tastefully done sex scenes in cinema hmm i don't know about you guys but it sex scenes are something that have the potential to annoy me if they're not essential to the story if they're mm -hmm. just you know frivolous like sex scene just thrown in yeah um, yeah it's it like really what are you trying me. to do there it's like, am I supposed to get a boner right now? Like, <laughs> Yeah, like Game of Thrones is really bad for it. Oh, really? Right. <laughs> like, it gets to such a point where it's like... I'm not surprised. Like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so it's ridiculous. ridiculously over the top that yeah. I, it's actually distracting me from what's going on. Yeah. Team America? <laughs> yeah. supposed to make you laugh. Well, if it's supposed to make you laugh, it's, that's different. Do they mean like yeah. a tasteful one? I don't know. I get, like in Terminator, like uh, Sarah Connor and Kyle Reese... Like, I don't even remember it, really. <laughs> like, that's, like, fine. <laughs> the like, new Blade Runner pornographic. has one of my favorite ones. Mm -hmm. With the With giant The, like, the, like hologram. Yeah. Like, going cool. over the woman. Mm -hmm. That's, like, a, a unique one yeah. in my mind. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would also give kind of a similar answer. Um, the sex scene in her is kind of, like, bizarre. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, erotic role play more than a sex scene, but it works and it's important to the story you know yeah yeah that's a good example yeah that is yeah. there's a really bad one in uh i know who killed me with Lindsay lohan and it's just like it has nothing to do with the rest of the movie basically it's just like okay they're fucking now and it's like weirdly comedic it seems like they're trying to make as much noise as possible and the mom's like in the kitchen downstairs and it keeps cutting back to her and the music sounds like like that oh yeah so like a parody of that or something <laughs> <laughs> like a, like a parody of that. It's so weird. And this movie's su supposedly it's a horror movie, but that's just in there. So. Showgirls had a terrible one in the pool. Oh and yeah, that's like a total piece of <laughs> shit. Ah, yes, that was Sexy. a useful one. Like fortuitous nudity, fucking stupid, like <laughs> like scene. Like that scene made no sense and was so like comedic and bad, unintentionally. Surprised you're not mentioning. Uh, Don't look now, Ralph. Would you consider that one to be? Oh yeah, I guess that. Yeah, that's a good one. I guess. Yeah. Because they were just like a couple. It wasn't trying yeah. to be like pornographic. They just like walked around naked. He was like brushing his teeth naked. Yeah. It's like, okay. That That's was like one of the more interesting do. aspects. Yeah. If you're presenting people like normally, like I guess they do things like that. They walk around naked and have sex. Yeah. yeah. It's like we're a gratuitous horror movie or something. 
those are the yeah patterns. it should always have a purpose in the story and that's you know mm-hmm. completely independently of whether or not it's a sex scene like every every part of the movie should have a purpose it's just it sometimes feels really out of place when it's like oh and here's a sex scene and this is the one part of the movie that like serves literally no purpose and you're just throwing it in there to show a titty yeah like, i don't know or like the room mm-hmm. like has terrible sex scenes oh god that are even oh, repeated. God. they just yeah, never like end that. yeah yeah it's like totally Those are pointless funny ones. and it goes on for two minutes. When yeah. the director casts himself for a sex scene, those are always amusing. Oh, no. uh-huh. <laughs> it's like, you're doing this for different reasons. <laughs> a sex scene that stands out in my mind is that really fucked up one from, uh, well, I guess it's kind of spoilers, but in, in the movie Gone Girl, there's one towards the yeah. end. <laughs> yeah. Which well, is like, yeah, let's oh. just not specify it, I guess. We yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. like midsummer midsummer has a sex scene yeah <laughs> it's or, yeah <laughs> that one's messed up <laughs> fucking love gun girl uh-huh gun yeah Girl's man, great. it's amazing i'd like really when they use something movie. like that like a sex scene for like a kind of crucial story moment or some kind of expression yeah beyond it just being oh yeah, yeah. Porn. i'm now yeah. thinking of uh there's at least one sex scene in synecdoche new york and it's not like gratuitous. You're not supposed to get a boner. You're supposed to feel sad. You know, it's just like it's like pathetic. Yeah. Anomaly so has that sex yeah. scene as well. Ah, uh, that that's a great one. That's a really great one. Because like that mm. that would be one of the top examples for me of like ones where where you actually feel some emotion from it, and it's like important to the yeah. characters, sort of thing. It's very like natural and human too. There's so mm-hmm. much going on in there artistically. That it it never feels like, haha, we're just showing a a titty, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Jerk like of time. Yeah. yeah. Everybody <laughs> unzip them, boys. <laughs> <laughs> right in the theater. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, Pee Wee Herman. Yeah. <laughs> Big mistake. Suicide King underscore fifteen says this. What is your opinion on the theory of Signs, The Happening, and After Earth being a trilogy set in the same universe? Does this change your viewpoints of M. Night? <laughs> I've never heard this before. They is might have like just pulled this thing? out of their ass. I don't know. I feel like I would have heard about this shit before. <laughs> Everything's That's like a, a theory. It's like the Pixar theory and all these fucking superhero theories. I wouldn't be yeah. surprised if after glass it was like he decided to make the uh, m night Shyamalan y- universe cinematic hmm. universe well as much as i Directors love all three that. of those movies i don't think they're connected <laughs> <laughs> well like yeah, uh, sure. tarantino a lot of his movies are set in the same world they have like the same burger joint or something like you can see that in a few of the, the movies. cool little easter egg yeah yeah but maybe it's something like that where like m night's not trying to make a trilogy of movies maybe he's like i don't he throws in some things to connect them i don't even you know he's think that's the case he's a little full of himself because uh-huh. jaden smith at the very beginning of after earth is like the entire thing is an exposition dump where he talks about the history <laughs> of like the planet uh-huh. and stuff You'd think that he would mention that trees tried to kill people at some point in that exposition. <laughs> You'd think that that would be like a weird, relevant thing. I don't know. Because like, yeah, like the aliens the, the and whole... signs are not the aliens. Yeah. Then aliens came down. And... Yeah, that yeah, too. He's like, yeah, this is the second time aliens happened, actually, the Ursa. Like, because the, the whole <laughs> introduction where he's talking about that shit, like the, he, he does play into the whole like, oh, yeah, and we killed the environment and that's why we had to do this and this. You'd think that if that tied into the happening, that would be where it tied in. But he doesn't mention that. So yeah, I think this person pulled yeah. it out of their fucking ass. And if you want to, <laughs> if you want to make a, a compelling argument on the subreddit, I would love to see it. But I'm not sure there yeah, is a compelling same. argument there. I would love to see it. Surely, um, signs being connected to the happening and after Earth is only bad for signs anyway, right? Because signs <laughs> is the one out of those three that anyone will defend. <laughs> Who the yeah, fuck I, is defending the, the happening or after Me, Earth? Me. They're fucking great. There's so much more entertaining. It's not making signs better that the happening is funny. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, this makes it a little better for me. (laughs) I've seen the happening in After Earth more times than I've seen signs. Yeah, I'll gladly watch them again right away. So long. Yeah, maybe we should. uh, Maybe we should discuss it at some point. Where does the village sit in this this trilogy? The village is the most boring, in my opinion. Yeah, I could see that. It's like right where he starts falling off the the deep end. Yeah. Right when people are starting to be like, oh, wait, is M. Night not great? That was like the moment. <laughs> it was that movie. 
debatably the lady in the water was when more people were like okay <laughs> this is bad <laughs> but that yeah. was when i remember everyone like properly turning on him yeah was the village was a bit more yeah. split yeah. yeah nobody liked lady in the water <laughs> and then after that he just came out with hit after hit yeah no i watched glass recently god it's bad man it's actually it's actually like insufferably bad like i couldn't believe how bad yeah. it was it's horrendous I I really want I might have mentioned this before, but I really, really, really want like a big M night Blu ray box set. But I don't think that'll ever happen because the, the the target demographic for his good movies is not the same as the target demographic for his bad movies. Who's gonna buy that yeah, box set other than me is the question. Like you can't release it without releasing no it like somewhat ironically, <laughs> which might be yeah. a little offensive for him. I don't know. <laughs> But I want it. I want it to exist. The big criterion. What a box after set Earth. that would be. You have like Last Airbender and After Earth next to yeah. the like signs, and then and then uh, Sixth Sense. <laughs> Unbreakable. Unbreakable. Yeah. Uh. It's the perfect filmography. <laughs> There's art within the filmography timeline itself. It shows a downward spiral. There's a story within that story. <laughs> yeah. That's why I love him so much. <laughs> All right. You want to do one more question? Yeah, we can do one more. There's there's one I want to end on from uh, Manny Dog Wah Wah Four, who says, "As you may know, The Last of Us Two has recently been leaked online and is now receiving huge amount of backlash on the direction the story goes. My question for you guys are: Do you think that the game will still be good? Do you think people are overreacting? And most importantly, do you think Naughty Dog will recover? So, yeah, The Last of Us Two leaked." Um, a couple hours of like footage and the whole plot synopsis and everything mm-hmm. it was uh, all leaked and is out there if you wish to view it. Um, we won't mm-hmm. say anything now if we have seen any of it. Yeah, and then they changed the release date. They were like, it's postponed mm-hmm. indefinitely, and then the leaks happened. They're like, uh, it's coming out in a month, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Yeah. yeah so just, yeah. I'm hoping it's, it's that like a doesn't worse play a big nightmare. role. Because like, I don't want them to release an unfinished game just because it was leaked. That's my biggest concern. Is not even necessarily where the story goes. It's like them releasing an unfinished game. That's that's my concern. Um, yeah. In yeah. terms of the leaks, I haven't like I know a couple basic things about the leaks. I've seen like maybe a couple screenshots, but spoilers don't really ruin an experience for me generally. Um, but I don't seek them out anyway because I know I'm going to play the game, even if it's to play it because it's funny. Bad. That's just content for my gaming channel. I'm going to play it either way, and hopefully it's good. I liked the first game enough that. Hopefully, you know, the same, if if the soundtrack's as good, then that's one thing I'll definitely like about it. I don't mm. know, I, I haven't looked into them enough, so I won't say this with certainty, but I'm kind of getting vibes of like that whole marriage story Twitter thing where people are yeah. judging it based on part of what it is and perhaps in the broader context of what the story is, it's more acceptable. Now, I should repeat, I don't really know the full extent of what's actually going on in these leaks, so maybe maybe I'm full of shit, but I'm going to have to see when it comes out anyway. Mm-hmm. I think who people knows? are upset where the story goes with it. I, I've seen like some things, some spoilers, but yeah, yeah, I, I, it's a shitty situation for everybody involved. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah. There was like speculation that like they weren't playing, paying their employees or something. And then somebody leaked that it. Was like, that was debunked. That was debunked. It was a just disgruntled employee who leaked it. Yeah, that's that's not true. Yeah, yeah it wasn't actually that. Yeah, that's yeah. not true. It was it was oh. like hackers that were using like um, the online connections. Oh, on, weird. Like Uncharted multiplayer and Jesus. like The Last of Us multiplayer to Gotta get, get your into security like better. A, PSN. What the yeah, fuck? Naughty Dog like servers or something, and they got like a terabyte worth of data and just put mm. it out there. That's insane. Yeah. And just like, why? Yeah. <laughs> why would you do it? <laughs> That's so know. weird. But it's it, it's just the story too. Like as far as the gameplay and all that, maybe all that's good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from, I don't know from what people are complaining about. I have no idea. It's just yeah, certain things that happen in the it story is, yeah. that people don't like. And maybe in the movie it'll be better, or, or in the in the game it'll be better. Like once you see it played out. Yeah, maybe. I just like yeah. the first game a lot. I'm holding out hope for this one. I do also want to mention that part of the controversy is also that they were like copyright claiming people's videos for discussing the leaks without even really showing footage of it 
That's pretty mm-hmm. bad if that's right. true. Were they? That, oh, yeah. Supposedly, yeah. They, they I mean, people just, are talking about they it. To but I haven't like, clicked on any of, of these it. videos because I'm not interested in the, the leaks. I want to play the game first. Right. So when that's uh-huh. out, then maybe I'll revisit these videos talking about that happening. But I just like I'm I'm not seeking out the leaks at the moment, so I can't really. Yeah, be as it's hard to know the it. truth because it could be just people uploading actual clips of the game and having their videos like fairly taken down for posting something against the mm-hmm. rules. And then, yeah, like, but even if you're like commenting on it and criticizing it, that's still fair use, though, right? So you're you're saying like it's potentially uh, a scenario so, where there's that, like like no commentary even. If if you took the, the like leaked clips of that game right now and tried to put it in a YouTube video, it would get taken down. It would like get taken down, but I don't think that it's not fair use though. Uh, it's it's irrelevant where the footage comes from and whether or not it's published. I believe. I think yeah yeah I think it's just because it's not a released product that they're able to just be like no like. It, the second the game comes out, you can say whatever you want about yeah. anything in the game. I can understand but... why they're trying to do that, but I don't think they would necessarily have the legal right in court. I think yeah, I think that there is a fair use know. argument to make for sure, even if it's leaked yeah, footage. Maybe. Yeah, I, I I can understand it. There must be a lot of anger, <laughs> like if you've worked on a project for that yeah. many years. Oh, and of then course. Right it's before gotta, it comes out, like the whole them thing off. is like the cat's out of the bag. That's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, it's really lame. It's just a disaster it scenario. Lame. Like. Uh, <laughs> The debate in my head is like, how much of this is, is it fair to like criticize and cancel your pre-orders and judge it before the game yeah, who knows? is even out and no one's played it. So it does seem strange for like, I saw so many reports of like people canceling their pre-orders and like truly furious about where the story goes. But it's like, yeah, I've, I've, I've read a lot of the like stuff that came out and it's like, yeah, like it really depends how these beats are like implemented into a plot to me like this could be really unsatisfying or it could be kind of interesting like you, it's, it's hard to know without yeah. some of the context yeah it's an annoying situation <laughs> but whatever also i don't know if people canceling their pre-orders had a gigantic impact because i read no. like five days ago I mean. that they went gold from pre-orders so clearly they have a net positive i guess oh the game's gonna be huge either way We'll see. Even if it's terrible, I'll enjoy it. I I like laughing mm-hmm. at things, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I I bet it'll be fine. It might be a fun game. <laughs> we'll have to or see. Just like a gameplay level. Yeah. All right. I guess that's it for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe go. Awesome. So we've got a recommendation for the next episode, and in the order that we <laughs> were doing before because we swapped me and Ralph. Normally, it would be Alex's this time. And I have this all written down, everybody, so don't worry. It's very complicated. <laughs> but we're having a special guest on uh, next episode. And I decided, to, why not let the guest pick this time? Because I know that uh, they're very passionate about films and have a lot of interesting perspectives and yeah, so the the guest is uh, Matt Johnson, director of The Dirties and Operation Avalanche and uh, creator of uh, Nirvana the Band the Show, which is a hilarious television show that I would definitely recommend. Yes, very fun. Oh, yeah. And so uh, he's going to be on next week in the uh, film that uh, he was wanting to talk about is uh, F for Fake, Orson Welles, a documentary, <laughs> cool. I think. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. And I haven't awesome. seen that. That's been on my watch list for a while. It's got a criterion. So yeah, we'll have uh, we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about uh, Matt Johnson stuff, and uh, should be a lot of fun. Have you, uh, mm-hmm. Ralph? You've seen a run of the band, the show. Alex, have you seen that? Yeah. Yet? No, I haven't seen it. I've heard good things, but have I've you never seen any got around to watching it. Matt Johnson thing? Um, I've only seen uh, your interviews with him. For me, okay. Honest. <laughs> okay. Cool. Well. Now is a good time <laughs> if, yeah, uh, if you want to catch up on some of his stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you all for listening to the show. If you want to support the show, uh, $2 a month, sardonicast.com. So I'm, sign up for premium. You'll get these episodes early as they're edited. Also, patreon.com slash sardonicast. Uh, we also got merch. Link in the description. Thank you all very much. Woo. Get that merch. And my axe. Take the Jenkum to Isengard. Ugh. That was like one of the most annoying memes for me. 
It's like that hobbits to Isengard. You really don't like that one. I don't know why. It's just kind of irritating. It's too much of like, ha ha, lol, random, funny meme culture. Just brings me back to like a bad, a bad vibe. <laughs> just a know? horrendous time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Let epic funny meme. Anyway. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.